And we are live. Let's see who's going to be first to join. Who is going to be first today? I think there's going to be a few. We have an NXL higher tier paper today. Let's see. Guitar has joined. Welcome, welcome. Robert has joined. Hello. Ira Prifty has joined. Guys, let me know in the comments. Can you hear me? Am I loud and clear? Can you hear me? Let me know. Welcome, Anna. Karen says, hey. Rosie says, hey. Mo Hussein, hello. Stepper says, yo, good to have you. Hey, the regulars are here. Nice to see you. Gundo, man like Alvarez is here. How you doing, Stepper? Love Heart is here. Come on, Rosie. Thank you for letting me know you can hear. Nice, Tyrese. Guys, let me know. How has your day been? Another day of our half term. Has it been a productive one? Has it been an unproductive one? I know people in the Discord are talking a bit about procrastinating. Definitely some of you will have been doing that a bit. Hello, Ella. Good to have you. Baby Girl D21. Welcome back. Oh, and Ali. Welcome back. Guys, a lot of you are asking what paper. Today is going to be the Edexcel June 2020 Paper 2 Higher Tier. Edexcel June 2020 Paper 2 Higher Tier. Hello, Kira. Hafsa says it's not been the most productive one today. Yep, I'm sure a lot of you guys might be feeling like that, but it is time for a comeback because we're going to get a nice past paper done five till seven. Apple user says when is foundation? It's going to be on Friday. It's going to be on Friday, the next foundation paper. Dirk says, yo, welcome back. Riza says perfect paper for me. Come on, that's good to hear. Okay, okay, okay. Karima says which past paper? Today, guys, at Excel, June 2020, paper two. Can you do this even if you do AQA? Yes, definitely. Yes, definitely. Is it going to be the same as doing an AQA paper? No. However, are at Excel and AQA extremely similar? Yes, they are. Some slight differences um, in content, very slight, but pretty much everything is um, overlaps. And also some differences in terms of how the questions are worded, but they're very, very similar. Like I say, so you'll definitely still benefit. You'll definitely still benefit. Let's have a look. Jack Sloman in the house. How you doing, man? Good to have you. Hey, no worries, Mr. Gilly. Hopefully it was a good session. Hopefully it was a good session climbing. Um, let's have a look. Paula Stairs. Hello. Hello. How you doing? Um, somebody said, did you go to a private school? Nope. I went to a state school. Uh, my school was actually in special measures. A few of you guys have been saying, oh, you must have gone to some really good school and everything. At my time of doing GCSEs, my school got put into special measures. So, uh, yeah. Okay, let's have a look. Dan, hello, hello. Jatin says, what's the plan for today? Today, we're going to be doing an Edexcel higher tier paper two. It's the June 2020 paper. June 2020 paper. Looking at the chat. Hello, Angela is back. Love to see it. Welcome, welcome. And I'll pronounce your name correctly today. Don't you worry about that. Um, let's have a look. Jess says, when are you planning on starting the actual paper? 10 past. We always have 10 minutes at the start just to give people a chance to join. Amy is here. Joseph is here. Nice, nice, nice. The community is growing. Um, so yeah, 10 minutes at the start just to let people join and also to give people a chance to print the paper if they want to. I always do announce it on the IG at the start of the day. Um, today was a little bit late. I think I did it at like one o'clock. I always put it in the comments of the live schedule post at the top of the IG. So you can always find it there. Gecko says what paper? June 2020 at Excel, paper two higher tier. That's the one. Ah, Karen says my printer's broken. Oh, worst timing, worst timing. Try and get access to one and print off a bunch of them in advance. Yeah, okay, okay, let's go. Love to see it. Um, intermediate papers, nope. We are only doing uh, GCSE papers, Hiram Foundation. Um, and uh, yeah, at Excel and AQA we focus on. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Another person asking about the accent. I'm actually fully British. Um, I like I've lived in the UK my whole life as well. I'm from the Midlands. I do have a few international mates, like some of my closest friends. They're from like all around the world, to be honest. So I've picked up a bit of a twang, maybe. But I'm actually fully British. Um, where can we get the paper? You can get it on many different websites. Anywhere you find the GCSE papers. I do have a website, mygcsemaths.com. It's completely free um, and all of the papers are there for AQA, Edexcel and OCR. And also I have a bunch of videos, question sheets, all that stuff. Um, hey, Victor, man, I'm sorry to hear you're not feeling too good today. Sorry to hear. 
Um, yeah, no worries, man. If, you, if, you're, if you're feeling a bit rough today, you say you got a migraine, just take it easy, take it easy. Maybe just let me do the hard work, like let me do the questions and just listen to the answers. But if you're feeling up to it, you know, give a few of them a go as well. Um, what time does it start? We're going to be starting at 10 past. We'll start the actual paper at 10 past today. And also, guys, let me know. I've done this a couple of times. I've asked a couple of times. Could one of the moderators please set up a poll? Um, actually, Mr. Gilly, if you can hear me, you do it just so not everybody does it. And we end up with like five polls. Um, could you set up a poll just asking um, whether you'd like me to start at five past going forwards or at 10 past? Because I have asked a couple of times on the chat. Everyone has said 10 past the last couple of days. Um, but I want to I want to see it in a poll so we can give everyone a chance to... Uh, to reply. Finn says 10 pass. Yeah. Scarlett says 10 pass. Okay. Most people are saying 10 pass though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll set up in the poll anyway, just to see the majority. When will you next be doing AQA? Tomorrow. For those of you who don't know, I think we've got quite a few new people, 390 at the moment. Um, I'm going live every single day, 5 p.m. until 7 p.m until the end of your GCSC math. So I've been doing this for the last five or six days um, and I'm gonna do it until the end of your GCSE maths exams. We switch between at Excel, AQA, higher foundation. You can see the details of which exam board and um, which tier at the top of my Instagram page. There's a post pinned to the top which has like the schedule basically. Okay, so did you do A-level maths? I did, I did, I did A-level maths and further maths actually. Um, let's have a look. Any more questions, guys? Do you do OCR foundation? Not specifically, not specifically. Unfortunately, because a lot fewer people do OCR, we only finish, uh, focus on um, AQA and Edexcel. Yeah, when do we start the paper? Nice. Um, looking at the chat. Somebody said is uh, A-level maths hard. That's gonna depend person to person. Personally, I didn't find it too bad, but I did further maths as well, right? So that's a completely biased opinion. I know in general, people find it pretty, pretty difficult. People find it difficult. However, don't be put off by that. All A-level subjects are difficult. Don't expect an easy ride. I think the jump from GCSE maths to A-level maths um, is reasonable. It's definitely, a big, uh, it's definitely a big step, but it's not, um, it's not unreasonable, I don't think, looking at the chat now. But I do know in general, I mean, A-level maths is a difficult subject, that's for sure. Um, looking at the chat, looking in the chat. Hey, Adam Murphy, that is so good to hear, mate. That is so, so good to hear. Thanks for letting me know. Said, hello, I did exams in November, got 32% in maths. Started watching, got 64% in Feb. Hey, my pleasure, mate, my pleasure. That's, uh, that's so great to hear. That's so great to hear. Um, somebody said, what did you get in further maths A-level? Uh, I got an A-star. Um, let's have a look. What paper today says, Drizzy? Today, Edexcel, June 2020, paper two, higher. That's the one today. What did you get in leaving? I'm not sure what, what, that, uh, what that question means. Um, let's have a look. A couple of people are saying, will this be beneficial if I do OCR? It will still be beneficial. There is less overlap between OCR and AQA and Edexcel. AQA and Edexcel are very, very similar, so the overlap there is very significant. OCR is slightly more different, more differences in content, more differences in how the question's wording, um, or in how the questions are worded. So there's less overlap. Will it still be beneficial though? Definitely. If the options are this stream or doing an OCR past paper, do the OCR past paper. If the options are this stream or watch Netflix for two hours, definitely do this stream, <laughs> definitely do this stream. Um, that's what I would say. Yeah, a lot of people, uh, a lot of the people doing OCR I know aren't big fans of OCR. Um, let's have a look at the chat. Um, do you do IGCSE past papers? Nope, unfortunately not, just regular GCSE. Uh, CE said, I just finished watching Netflix. Hey, perfect timing. Netflix before the session and then five till seven, we get into it and we, uh, we get some productive time in. Jacob says, is this AQA? This one is Edexcel. And I can see actually the stream is growing. 350 people. Let's see. We're going to get going now with the paper because it is 10 past. Let's see how many people leave, guys. How many people were just here for the chat at the start? Let's have a look. I am now going to flip the camera, guys. Just give me a second. Hopefully the tripod is playing ball this evening. 
coming down, flipping camera. Let's have a look. Hopefully this is clear, guys. Let me know. Can you see this clearly? I think I will move up just a little bit so we can see the edges of the iPad coming down. Let me know in the chat, guys. Is this clear? Ella says yes. Karima, yes. Angel, yes. Sonia says yes, it's clear. Okay, fantastic, guys. Fantastic. So we are going to get into it without any further ado. Today we have the June 2020 Paper 2 Higher Tier Edexcel paper. So I've put the name of the paper up at the top. Um, there's some information at the bottom, live every day. Um, the recording will be posted to the channel tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. And with that said and done, let's get into it. Question one says write 84 as a product of its prime factors. I know today there are a bunch of new people. So basically the format, if, you're, if you haven't been here before, is that I'll give you guys a bit of time to answer each of the questions and then I will go through the answer. The more marks the question, the more time I will give you. Um, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Neil Astor said, do you recommend taking further? If you mean further maths, I would say if you enjoy maths, and um, you and you end up getting a grade nine, then you should consider taking further maths. However, if you struggled a bit with GCSE maths, you definitely don't want to take uh, further maths. Further maths is pretty pretty difficult. I've got to say, further maths is pretty pretty difficult. I would say the step between regular maths and further maths is quite big. Okay, looking. At the chat, let's have a look. The question says, write 84 as a product of its prime factors. Are we ready? Drop ready in the chat when you're ready and we can go through it. Harry says, is this useful for... Okay, the poll just popped up and everybody is saying 10 past, so we'll stick with that. Zane B is ready, A is ready, Karima is ready. Okay, guys, let's talk about it. How are we going to write 84 as a product of its prime factors? The key, guys, when writing a number as a product of its prime factors is to use our factor tree. We write 84 at the top, and then we want to split this into two numbers, which multiply to give 84. Seven times by 12 is 84, so we can write this as seven times 12, and we're gonna circle our seven because it's a prime number. 12 is not prime though, so we're gonna split it down even further. 12 can be written as four times by three. Circle the three now because it's prime. Finally, four can be split into two multiplied by two and circle them both because they are prime. Now, to write this 84 as a product of its prime factors, we multiply our prime factors together. We have two times by two times by three times by seven. Now, if we want to, we can simplify this. We can write it as two squared times by three times by seven but we don't have to in this case because it doesn't say to give our answer in index form. So you could, if you want to, if it says to give your answer in index form, you have to simplify it like this because two times two is two squared. But if it doesn't say that, you can do it if you want to, but you don't have to. One B, let's have a look. Another two marker. This time we want to find the lowest common multiple of 60 and 84. Mosin said, I still put it in index form. Yep, mate, that is completely fine. You can put it in, in index form or leave it completely up to you. Okay. Zane AB said, can we use the Venn diagram? We can use the Venn diagram. There are going to be two different methods here. One is going to be to write out our multiples of 60 and 84. That's the one that I'm going to do. The other one is the Venn diagram method. Hey, no worries, AMT. Good to have you. Good to have you. Let's have a look, guys. Drop ready in the chat when you're ready and we can talk about it. Okay. Angel's ready. Gabriella's ready. Let's have a look. Ellie's ready. Angela's ready. Okay, guys, let's talk about it. So question says, find the lowest common multiple of 60 and 84. The best way to do this, guys, my favorite way is just going to be to write out the multiples of 60 and 84, and then to find which the lowest common multiple of these two numbers is, find the lowest number, which is a multiple of each. First off, the multiples of 60, we have 60, 120, 180, 240, 300, 360, 
420 and let's go one more 480 now you could do that in your head guys right adding 60 each time or you could use a calculator and do one times 60 two times 60 three times 60 and do it that way what about our multiples of 84 the first one is going to be 84 adding 84 onto that we get 168 adding 84 onto that we get 252 adding 84 onto that we get 336 adding 84 onto that we get 420 adding 84 onto that we get 504 now we have a bunch of multiples of 60 and 84 and we can check which the lowest number is which is a multiple of each and we can see that 420 is in fact going to be the only number which is a multiple of both of these so that is going to be our lowest common multiple that is going to be our lowest common multiple now i know a few of you are going to want me to explain the venn diagram method i'm not going to do that now just because i made a very recent tiktok on it like two or three days ago so you can check that out it explains it a couple of people are asking the difference between multiples and factors the multiples of a number for example the multiples of four are going to be the number numbers which that number goes into so we have four eight 12, 16, etc. It's the times tables effectively of that number. The factors of the number are the numbers which go into a number. For example, the factors of 24 are going to be 1 and 24 because 1 times 24 is 24. 2 and 12 because 2 times 12 is 24. 3 and 8 because 3 times 8 is 24. And 4 and 6 because 4 times 6 is 24. So these are going to be our multiples and these are going to be our factors. Our answer here though, guys, don't get it twisted, is 420. Next question. Question two is on the screen. Now, even if you don't have this paper printed off, don't skip this question just because you see the Venn diagram. Draw out the Venn diagram and give it a go. You can definitely sketch out the Venn diagram yourself. Lil said the factor tree method is easier. Yep, some people think that's the case. Some people think that's the case. Um, I didn't go through that here, but I made a Venn diagram on uh, I made a Venn diagram. I made a TikTok on the Venn diagram method just a few days ago. Okay, a couple of people are asking, what's that weird symbol? I'm not sure which symbol you mean. If it's this one that you mean, this is the symbol for the universal set. Karima said, do you think loci would come up on calculator? Yes, it definitely can. Definitely can. Bree's not a fan of Venn diagrams. Hopefully after this question, you like them a little bit more. Let's have a look, guys. Drop ready in the chat when you're ready and we can go through it. Let's have a look. Okay, M's ready. Ethan's ready. Black Flag is ready. Mads is ready. Shabs is ready. Hey, welcome back, Shabs. Good to have you again. Good to have you again. Let's have a look, guys. We're told that the universal set, and that just means all of the numbers in the question, contains 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. We're told that A is the set of even numbers and that B is the set of factors of 10. And we're asked to complete the Venn diagram for this information. Now, we're going to have to take each of these numbers, 1 to 10, and either put them on the outside if they're not in A or B. In this section, if they're in A but not in B. In this section, if they're in A and B. And in this section, if they're only in A. So let's go through them. Starting with the number one. Is that an even number? Nope. Is it a factor of 10? Yes, it is because one times 10 is 10. So it's going to be in the B only box. What about two? Is two an even number? Yes, it is. Is two a factor of 10? Yes, it is because two times five is 10. So that is going to go in the middle. It's in A and it's in B. What about the number three? Is that even? No, it's not. Is that a factor of 10? No, it's not because three doesn't go into 10. So that's going to be on our outside number four. Is that even? Yes, it is. Is it a factor of 10? Nope. So it's in A only. What about the number five? Is that even? No, it's not. Is it a factor of 10? Yes, it is because two times five is 10. So that's going to be in our B only number six. Even? Yes, it is. Is it a factor of 10? No, it isn't. Left hand box number seven. Is it even? Nope. Is it a factor of 10? Nope. So we're going to put that on the outside. Number eight, is it even? Yes, it is. Is it a factor of 10? No, it isn't. So it's going to be in that A only box. Number nine is odd and it's not a factor of 10. And finally, the number 10, is that even? Yes, it is. Is that a factor of 10? Yes, it is. So that's going to go in our middle box. 
Now we filled in our Venn diagram method our Venn diagram method. We filled in our Venn diagram, guys. Let's have a look at question 2B. It says a number is chosen at random from the universal set. Find the probability that this number is in the set A, weird sign, which I will explain in a minute, B. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Victor says, does this sign mean and? Victor, you are exactly right. You are exactly right. So this sign here means in a mathsy way, it means intersect. In a kind of non mathsy way, which is the best way of thinking about it, it means and. And I like to think of that as A and B, A and B. You know, if you say the word and really quickly, I went to the shop and I bought a bottle of water. And sounds a lot like un, so that's how I like to remember it, A and B. So we want the probability that a number chosen at random is in the set A and B. Which area on the Venn diagram, guys, represents A and B? Well, it's going to be this section here. These are the ones which are in A and in B. Now, what's the probability that a number chosen at random is in this area? Well, how many numbers are there in total? There are 10. How many numbers are there in this section? There are two, so it's going to be two out of 10. Two over 10, that is going to be our answer to question 2B, guys. Two over 10, because two of our numbers out of our 10 numbers are in that section. Next question is going to be on the screen. Actually, somebody just asked a great question, which is, can you explain what to do if it's you? Yep, I won't go through this for too long, but if it said this, A, U, B. This one means A union B. That's the mathsy way. The same as this one meant intersect in a mathsy way, but we really just say and. This in a mathsy way means union, but what we're just going to say is or. So this is going to be the group which is in A or B. Now, what does that mean? That means it can be in A or it can be in B or it can be in both. So if we were going to shade this on the Venn diagram, guys, what section would it be? It would be the group A or B, which is in the middle, or yeah, the group of A, or both, or just B. So we have this, this, and this as our group. A lot of people think that it's this section and this section, but we also can include this section. What would the probability be, guys? It would be 7 over 10 this time, because there are 7 numbers inside these circles, and 10 numbers overall, so it would be 7 over 10 for A or B. Ruby said, what would A apostrophe mean? That is another great question. A apostrophe, what that means is it means not A. So if we have this A, what, what um, section would it be? It would be this section here, which is our group A. But if instead of A, we had A apostrophe, and this comes up quite often, it would be everything outside of A everything outside of A. So everything on the Venn diagram, which is not in the A circle, that is what A apostrophe would mean. Moving on now, guys, hopefully that made sense. Any questions, let me know. We have our first long question of the day. This is a five marker, so I'll give you a little bit more time for this. Very classic proportion question. These come up all the time in paper two. Pretty much always towards the front end of paper two, we have a question like this. Pretty much always. Looking at the chat now, guys. So if you have any questions, let me know. Mads is a fan of these ones. Let's have a look. Abiola said, your live notifications don't go off. Let me know what you mean by that. Maybe I need to change the settings. Yeah, Bellingham said, we had a question like this yesterday, didn't we? Yes, we did. And that kind of emphasizes, guys, this is really typical of a paper two. Really typical of a paper two. Looking at the chat, guys, if you have any questions about the previous one, let me know. I'll give you another couple of minutes before I go through this. Giving a little hint here, one of the keys is going to be 
to work out the number of tins in small boxes and the number of tins in large boxes. Use that to find the number of large boxes and the number of small boxes and then go from there. Harry, nice work, nice work. We want to find the number of large boxes and small boxes, or sorry, the number of tins in large boxes and small boxes. Use that to find the number of large boxes and small boxes and go from there. Don't worry, Lev, I'll give you guys a couple more minutes. Okay, looking at the chat, if you guys have any questions, this, by the way, is a particularly annoying question, I have to say. These type of questions come up all the time, but I think the wording of this question is horrendous. Whoever wrote this did a really bad job of um, like wording the question because it's not actually clear what you need to do. However, don't worry, we are going to make this clear. We are going to make this clear. But yeah, this is about whoever wrote this definitely did maths and not English. Lils, that is the correct first step. That is the correct first step. Guys, let me know in the chat. Are you ready me? For, are you ready for me to start going through this? Let me know. Are you ready for me to start going through this? Robin's ready. Famalam's ready. Unicorn's ready. Love Heart's ready. Okay, guys, let's talk about it. So the question says that Carlo, to be fair, that's a pretty good name by the standards of the exam board. Nice name. Carlo puts tins into small boxes and into large boxes. He puts six tins into each small box and he puts 20 tins into each large box. Carlo puts a total of 3,000 tins into the boxes so that the ratio of the number of tins in small boxes to the number of tins in large boxes is two to three. Carlo says that less than 30% of the boxes filled with tins are large boxes. Is Carlo correct? So we're going to have to work out in the end the number of um small boxes and large boxes that we have. How are we going to do it? Our first step is going to be to work out the number of tins in small boxes and the number of tins in large boxes. How are we going to do that? Well, we know that we have 3,000 tins in total and we know that the ratio of the tins in small boxes to large boxes is two to three. What we can do is we can add together the parts of our ratio to find the total number of parts. We do two plus three equals five and then we can do 3,000 tins divided by five, and that's going to work out the size of one part in our ratio. 3,000 divided by five, do this on your calculator, we would get 600. Now, where can we go from there? Well, we know the size of one part of our ratio, so we can use that to find the number of tins in small boxes and the number of tins in large boxes. So let's write out number of tins in uh, small boxes. Well, we know that one part is equal to 600, but we have two parts. So we're going to do two times by 600. That's going to give us 1,200, our number of tins in small boxes. What about our number of tins in large boxes? Let me just copy and paste this, save a couple of seconds, paste that in, swap small for large. So our number of tins in large boxes, well, in our ratio, we have three parts for large boxes. So we're going to do three parts times by 600 tins in each part, that's going to give us 1,800. Now, we know the number of tins in small boxes and the number of tins in large boxes. Where can we go from there? Now we can work out the number of small boxes and the number of large boxes. That's because we know how many tins are in small boxes, and we know that there's six tins in each small box. So we can do 1,200 divided by six, which if we did on our calculator would be 200. And that's going to be the number of small boxes. So number of small boxes. We went from our number of tins in small boxes, divided it by our number of tins in each small box, got our number of small boxes. We can do the same thing with our large boxes. We know that we have 1,800 large boxes in total. We can divide that by our number of tins in each large box. We do 1,800 divided by 20. We can use a calculator for that. We're going to get 90. And that's the number of tins. Sorry, the number of large boxes. That's our number of large boxes. Now, Carlo says less than 30% of the boxes filled with tins are large boxes. How can we find whether Carlo is correct? Well, we want to find the number of tins. Sorry, the number of 
we want to find the percentage of boxes which are large. We know that we have 90 large boxes in total. So we have 90 large boxes in total out of how many boxes in total do we have? We have 200 small ones and 90 large ones. So we have 290 boxes in total. So our fraction of boxes which are large is 90 over 290. How can we find our percentage? Well, we can multiply our fraction by 100. If we type that into our calculator, guys, what would we get? We would get 90 divided by 290. And we would have to multiply that by 100. We get 31.03 as our answer. So 31.03% of our boxes are large boxes. Now, is Carlo correct? He says that less than 30% of the boxes are large. We found that 31% are. So unfortunately, Carlo is wrong. Unfortunately, Carlo is wrong. Guys, let me know in the chat. How was that? Was it a bit clearer after I explained it? I did have to get up in the middle to open the door to let the dog in. So I, I was a little bit, I got a little bit distracted, but hopefully you guys didn't even notice. Um, hopefully the explanation made sense. Nova said, yes, it was clearer. Ella said, easy when you explain. Okay, fantastic, fantastic. Black flag, good to hear it makes sense. Lily Marshall, good to hear it makes sense. Nice. Um, where did the 290 come from? Great question. That was just when the dog came in. So that was when I got distracted. Um, 290 was our total number of boxes. We had 200 small boxes and we had 90 large boxes. So in total, we had 290 boxes. 90 of those 290 were large. That's how we did that. Mia said, why do you times it by 100? Another fantastic question. The reason is because that converts our fraction into a percentage. So if we did 90 over 290, we would have got 0.31, and then we times it by 100 to turn it into a percentage. Yeah, nicely explained, Ali, nicely explained, Mia. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Guys, I'm gonna give you five seconds to screenshot that, then I'm gonna move on to the next question. And after I've done that, I can answer any of your questions about that particular one. Um, where did you get the 90 from? Um, we That was our number of large boxes. That was our number of large boxes. The 290 was the number of small boxes plus the number of large boxes. Five, four, three, two, one. Guys, next question on the screen. Question four, another classic paper two question. Let's see what we can do. Let's see what we can do. Question four. This qu this uh, paper, by the way, guys, is quite short. It's a, I think there's 21 or 22 questions in this paper. And the last one is pretty nasty, I've got to say. The last one is pretty nasty. To anybody wondering if we have a channel or an Instagram or anything like that, you can find all of the links in my uh, in the link tree, which is in my bio. Kay's a fan of these ones, love to see it. A little bit nicer after the last one. Um, sorry, that power is quite small. Let me zoom in a little bit. It says complete the table of values for y equals five minus x cubed. They give us a table. And then it says on the grid below, draw the graph of y equals five minus x cubed for values of x from minus two to two. Also, it's so good to see that the chat is so positive. Everyone's helping each other. It's absolutely awesome. I just want to say a quick thanks to the moderators um, because you must be doing a good job getting rid of anyone who's uh, who's putting dodgy stuff. So uh, yeah, thanks for the help, guys. Ah, nice, uh, nice that the videos were helping. Nice that the videos were helping. Okay, guys, drop ready in the chat when you're ready for me to talk through this one and we can go through it. Ah, that's good to hear, Mr. G. Good to hear. Um, somebody said, does the power go inside or outside the bracket? Um, it would go outside the bracket. If you mean what I think you do, it would go outside. Okay, quite a few people are ready. Sophia's ready. Nova's ready. Andrew's ready. Sonia's ready. Your future Ma is ready. Welcome back, your future Ma. Darcy's ready. Adele is ready. Okay, guys, let's talk about it. So very, very classic question for papers two and three. If you don't know how to do this at the moment, listen carefully. And after this, it should make sense. So the question says, complete the table of values for y equals five minus x cubed. And then it gives us a table of values. We have a bunch of values of x, and then we need to work out the corresponding values of y. This equation is gonna allow us to work out the value of y when x takes a certain value. What we're gonna to have to do is we're going to have to substitute in that value of x 
and then work out what it is. You could do this on your calculator. I'm going to do it by hand and just explain what I'm doing just to make it super clear. So when x equals minus 2, what is y going to be? y is going to be equal to 5 minus minus 2 cubed. Minus 2 cubed. Minus 2 times minus 2 is positive 4. Positive 4 times by minus 2 is minus 8. So we have 5 minus minus 8, which is 5 plus 8, which is 13. What about when x equals 0? A little bit easier, this one. We're going to substitute in x equals 0. We have 5 minus 0 cubed. 0 times 0 times 0. Well, that's just going to be 0. So we get y equals 5. Next up, substituting in x equals 1. 5 minus 1 cubed. 1 times 1 times 1 is just 1. So we have 5 minus 1. That's going to be 4. Finally, 5 minus 2 cubed. 2 cubed is 2 times 2 times 2, which is 8. 5 minus 8 is going to be minus 3. Guys, you can absolutely use your calculator to work those out, or you can work them out like I did. Next step, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to use these points to draw our graph. These points tell us the value of y when x has a certain value. These are coordinates. When x is minus 2, y is 13. Remember, we go along the corridor for our x and then up the stairs for our y. We have minus 2, 13. Next up, we have the point minus 1, 6. Across to minus 1, up to 6. There we go. Next, we have 0, 5. 0 across, 5 up. Next up, we have the point 1, 4. 1 to the right, 4 up. We get this point here. Next up, our final point, we have when x equals 2, y is minus 3. So we're going to plot that on. They, those guys are just our coordinates. Final step, what's it going to be? It's going to be to join together our points. Let's see what I can do live on air, whether we can make this smooth. Hey, that's not too bad, actually. You're definitely getting all your marks for that. That curve would be absolutely fine. Sometimes I do butcher it, but that one was pretty good. Now, I want to raise attention to a very particular part of this question. This part here. This trips so many people up, but they always put it in the exam. This says for values of x from minus 2 to 2. And people don't even notice that part. But what does it mean? It means that our line cannot go past minus 2 in the x direction and positive 2 in the x direction over here. Now we can see that the way I drew it, it did go a tiny bit past just because I didn't draw it um, perfectly. You would still get the marks for what I did. Um, but in reality, it should go um, perfectly to 2 and not go past that point at all. Let me know in the comments, guys, did, or the chat, I should say. Did you guys uh, fall into that mistake? Did you carry your line on? Or did you know that you had to stop at 2 and minus 2? That goes in all the time. Yeah, M said, OMG, mine did that. Would they reduce marks? If, you, if it was clear that you tried to stop here, you would get all the marks. Yeah, see, I told you a lot of people, a lot, a lot of people um, missed that bit off at the end. A lot of people missed that off. But yeah, whatever they say we have to go to here, it's X from minus two to two. So we go across to minus two in the X direction and across to two in the X direction over here. Alf said, is that an A minus X cubed graph? Yes, it is that. Yeah, yeah. Here, look, five minus X cubed. So it's the minus x cubed graph, but shifted five units up. Guys, next question we're going to go on. Max77 said, do you need to use pencil? No, you don't. You definitely don't. You'll get all the marks if you use pen. Should you use pencil? Yeah, definitely. Just so you can, uh, just so you can rub it out if you, if you mess up the drawing. Yeah, definitely preferable. Definitely preferable. A couple of people are saying trigonometry. Yep, this is trigonometry. Now, I know on my... Hot Topics video, my previous one for paper one, and also the one which I'm going to release tomorrow, Hot Topics video dropping tomorrow, guys. Um, I do say that nothing is guaranteed to come up, and these are only kind of hot topics. They're not guaranteed. I would say trigonometry is pretty much the only topic which is guaranteed to come up in paper two, and maybe paper three as well. Now, <laughs> I'm not saying it's guaranteed. Don't come at me saying, oh, you said it would come up, blah, blah, blah. But I would say it's extremely likely. I would say it's extremely likely. Um, somebody said, is there any way to rewind to the start? Great question. You can't rewind this to the start because we're live at the moment. However, this recording will be uploaded to the channel tomorrow morning, 9am. So you can watch it back either up until this point, or you can just watch the whole recording tomorrow. Question five guys, only a two marker. I've given you a while with it on the screen. Let's talk about it. It says, 
work out the value of x, give your answer correct to one decimal place. Now, here we are given a right angle triangle. We're told one angle and one side length and asked to work out another side length. In this situation, guys, it's going to be clear that we're going to have to use either so, ka, or toa. Now, some of you might be thinking, can't we use the sign rule? Technically, you can. However, pretty much always when we're using a or dealing with a right angle triangle, we're going to be using either so, ka, or toa. When we're using so, ka, or toa, what do we do? Our first step is going to be to label our sides opposite our angle. We have our opposite side. Opposite our right angle, we have our hypotenuse. And our final side is our adjacent. Next step is to identify whether we're using so, ka, or toa. This question involves the opposite side because that's what we want and the hypotenuse because that's what we're given. So we're going to be using so because that's one which includes opposite and hypotenuse. Now, what does so tell us? It tells us that sine of our angle is equal to our opposite side length divided by our hypotenuse. Where can we go from there? Well, we can substitute in what we know. We know that our angle in our question is 34 degrees. So we can say sine 34 equals our opposite side length, which is x, what we're trying to find out, over. And then we have our hypotenuse, which is 178 millimeters. So sine 34 equals x over 178. Now, guys, we have an equation which we can solve to find the value of x. At the moment, x is being divided by 178. So to get the x on its own, we can multiply both sides by 178. When we do that, we get 178 times sine 34 equals x, which when we bing into our calculator is going to give us the value of x. 178 times sine 34, we're going to get 99.536, etc. Question asks us to give our answer to one decimal place. Rounding this to one dp, guys, we look at our first decimal point or decimal place. Then we look at the next number. This is less than five. So we're going to round down. The five stays the same and we get our answer of 99.5. And they don't give us our unit. So we write it on. Well, actually, no, it just asks us for x. It's x millimeters. So we don't need a unit. We just write on our answer of x equals 99.5. That is going to be how we do that one. Live nicely done. Well done for that. Guys, let me know in the chat. How was that? Any questions, let me know. It always seems quite long when I explain these ones, but hopefully it made sense. Hopefully it was clear. May said, wait, question. How do I do trig? Oh, lost the question. Let me find it. How do I do trig to find a side with only one angle? Um, so you can either, with Sokartoa, you can either use two side lengths to find one angle or you can use one angle and one side length to find another side length. Hopefully that's clear. Ella liked that one. Karima liked that one. M liked that one. Sean liked it. Hafsa liked it. Okay, guys, fantastic. Tom said, if you put millimeters, would you lose a mark? To be honest, um, that it wouldn't say in the mark scheme whether you would or not. I would definitely give you the mark, and it's very unlikely that you would lose a mark very unlikely that you would lose a mark. If you had an examiner who had had a really, really bad day, they might try and take a mark off. But I mean, you really shouldn't lose a mark for that. Because it's obvious what you've done. Because um, it's obvious what you've done. Okay, let's have a look. Question six. Adele said, how many for um, question six? It's a two marker. It gives us two vectors, A and B. And then it asks us to find 2a minus 3b as a column vector. I'll give you guys a couple more minutes to do this, and then I will talk through the answer. When we get to roughly question 10, guys, I'm going to run a quick poll and see what the pace is like. We can either keep it the same, speed up or slow down. Normally, people say to keep the pace the same, but I'll ask again today anyway. So have a think now about whether you want me to speed up or slow down, and we can, uh, we can make any amends. Hafsa thinks it's minus 914. Shabs thinks the same. Michaela thinks the same. Okay, let's have a look. To anybody asking about the pace or saying about the pace, don't put it in the uh, in the chat because I'm not going to be able to see it. Just put it in the, make sure you put it in the poll when I run it. Okay, how are we going to do this? We have two vectors, three, four, and five minus two. 
and we're asked to find 2a minus 3b as a column vector. The key here, guys, is going to be to recognize or understand how we can multiply and subtract column vectors. Let's firstly write this out in a different form. We have two lots of a, so we have 2 times by our column vector 3, 4. And we're going to subtract 3 times by b. b is the column vector 5 minus 2. Now the question becomes, how can we simplify these column vectors? We can treat them very similar to how we would treat regular expanding brackets. What we can do to do 2 times by 3, 4 is we do 2 times the 3 and 2 times the 4. We get 6, 8, because 2 times 3 is 6 and 2 times 4 is 8. Next, we're subtracting 3 lots of this vector here. 3 times by 5 is 15. 3 times by minus 2 is minus 6. So we have the vector 6, 8, and we're subtracting 15 minus 6. When it comes to subtracting or adding column vectors, we're going to either add or subtract the tops and add or subtract the bottoms. Here we're subtracting, so on the top, we're going to do 6, take 15. That's going to be minus 9. And we're going to do 8 minus minus 6, which is 8 plus 6. So we're going to have 14 on the bottom which is 8 plus 6, and guys, we get our answer of minus 9, 14 for our column vector. Let me know. What do we reckon? I know there's going to be some mixed opinions in the chat. I know there's going to be some mixed opinions in the chat. Ah, okay, M said that makes so much sense. Hey, that is the sound of progress. Guys, I've said this before. I'll say it again, and I'll probably say it a few more times. We are not here to get every question right. We're here to get some questions wrong understand why we got them wrong and make progress from that. You don't make progress from getting everything right. You make progress from taking things from not being understood to understood. So the absolute best thing I can hear in the chat is that something didn't make sense now and, or sorry, didn't make sense before and that now it does. Okay. Nice, nice, nice. Hitesh, great that it makes sense now. Okay. A couple of seconds to screenshot this guys. And then I'm going to move on to the next question. I'm going to give you five, four, Three, two, one. Next question. To anybody putting comments about the pace in the chat, save them for when we get to question 10. I'll run a quick poll and see what the pace is like. Question seven. This one is a four marker. We're getting into longer questions now. And like I say, this quest this uh, paper has quite a lot of long questions. Um, there's 21 in total, I think, maybe 22, which isn't many, to be honest. Apple user said, will be this be in foundation? This could definitely be in a foundation paper towards the back end. It would be uh, a difficult foundation question, but it could be in a foundation paper. It does use content, which is all in foundation. Ah, uh, Sonia, that is not good to hear. That is not good to hear. <laughs> Hopefully you don't have to interrupt your maths to, uh, to sort it out. Somebody said pi r squared and then 1 over 4. Sorry, pi thag and then 1 over 4 pi r squared. Hitesh, my friend, you are correct. That is exactly what we need to do. That is the only hint I'm dropping. Another couple of moments because this is a four marker and then I will go through it. Thamalam, you are exactly right. Not me said when you go live. We're going to be live every day, 5 p.m. until 7 p.m. until the end of GCSE maths. Okay, people are starting to put some answers in the chat. Let me know in the chat if you are ready and we can go through it. No words at all, not me, no words at all. Let's have a look, drop ready if you're ready. Amy's ready, not me is ready. Um, Canadian Toaster is ready, what a name that is. Eric's ready, me is ready, Samir is ready, Angela's ready. Guys, let's talk about it. Question says, the diagram shows a right angle triangle and a quarter circle. The right angle triangle ABC has an angle ABC equals 90 degrees. We have a right angle triangle. The quarter circle has center C and radius CB. Work out the area of the quarter circle. Give your answer correct to three significant figures. You must show all your working. Now we know to work out the area of a circle, we can use pi r squared. The problem though is that we don't know this side here, which we're told is our radius. So what we're going to do is we're going to work that side out. Now, how can we calculate the size of this side length here? Well, over here we have a right angle triangle. 
we're told the size of this side, we're told the size of the hypotenuse. Remember guys, the hypotenuse is opposite our right angle. When we have a right angle triangle and we're told two side lengths and asked to work out the size of the final one, we can use Pythagoras' theorem. Pythagoras' theorem tells us that a squared plus b squared equals c squared, where c is our hypotenuse. So we can say that six squared, our side length here, plus b squared, our side length over here, equals nine squared. This is an equation which we can rearrange to find the value of b. 6 squared is 36, so 36 plus b squared equals 81. Take 81 from both sides. b squared equals 81. Take 36. We get 45, so b squared is 45. Now we can do the square root of both sides. b is going to be equal to the square root of 45. Now, a lot of you guys will be thinking, yeah, we could have done that so much quicker by just doing the square root of 9 squared. Take 6 squared. You are absolutely right. That is perfect. I just thought I would go through that to explain what's going on to people who, uh, who haven't learned it that way. We now know then that this side length here is a square root of 45. We now know the radius of our circle. The radius of our circle is the square root of 45. We can go from that to calculating our area. We know that the area of a full circle is pi r squared, but we don't have a full circle. We only have a quarter of a circle. So to work out the area of our quarter circle, it's going to be a quarter of pi r squared. Our radius is 45, so we have 1 over 4 times by pi times by the square root of 45 squared. This is something that we can type into our calculator. And when we do, what are we going to get? We have 0 0.25 times by pi times by 45. When we get that, well, when we type that in, we get 35.3429 dot, 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 dot. It asks us to give our answer to three significant figures. This is our first figure, our second figure, our third figure. So we look at the next one. It's a four because it's a four. We're going to round down. We get 35.3 to three significant figures. That, guys, is going to be our answer to anybody who got that right. Nicely done. To anybody who didn't understand that initially, Hopefully it makes sense now. If you have any questions, let me know. Um, Michaela says, wait, but 45 simplifies to 3 root 5. Yep, that is exactly right. So you could have written this as 3 root 5 and then done here 3 root 5 squared. That would have been completely fine. That would have been completely fine. Let's have a look. So you don't have to divide by an extra four, even though it's a quarter of a circle. Great question. We divided by four over here by doing a quarter of pi r squared. So we had one over four times what the area of the total circle would have been. Looking at the chat now, guys, let me know if you have any questions. Somebody putting that we have to put meter squared. Yep, it already gives it for us. Pretty much all of these questions will give you the unit um, unless it says give the units of your answer. So, uh, yeah, you would only need to write 35.3 down there. Shab says, nice. If it's three sig fig, do you round up if you can? Um, if this was a five or a six or a seven or an eight, then you would round up and you get 35.4. Because this is a four, you round it down to 35.3. Next question, guys. Question eight is on the screen. We have how many marks up for grabs here? A two marker and a three marker. I'll let you do both of these and then I'll go through them both at the same time. Looking at the chat now, if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, great question, um, Tamina Malik, or T Tamina, sorry, I read that wrong. Um, how come you rearranged the Pythagoras? The reason that we rearranged it was because normally when we use Pythagoras' theorem, we're trying to calculate the hypotenuse, right? We have a squared plus b squared equals c squared. C is our hypotenuse. We're given our two non-hypotenuse size and we're calculating the size of that hypotenuse. But in this question, we were actually given the hypotenuse and one of the others and asked to work out one of the other side lengths. So we had to rearrange it to find the other side length. Ah, okay, great that that made sense. Great that that made sense. Okay, man like Handy FF thinks it's 580. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Guys, drop ready in the chat when you're ready for me to go through question eight. This topic trips a lot of people up. This topic 
It's called reverse percentages, trips a lot of people up. M's ready, Amina's ready, Bree's ready. Okay, let's start talking about it. Let's start talking about it. And don't worry, I won't go through the second one yet. I'm just going to talk about this one. So very common topic again, this is very common topic in papers two and three. Let's talk about it. The question says Tariq buys a laptop. That is a very cool name. He gets a discount of 5% of the normal price. Tariq pays £551 for the laptop. Work out the normal price of the laptop. Now, a few of you guys might be thinking that we have to find 105% of 551. That is actually not going to be how we do this question. This, like I say, is a reverse percentages question. So we are given the new price and asked to work out the original price. How are we going to do it? The best way to do this, or the best way to understand this, I should say, is to think about what percentage of the amount we actually have. So we have 551 pounds, 551 pounds. And what percent of our original price is that? Well, it started off at 100% of the original price, and then we discounted it by 5%. So this is 95% of our original price. We're going to use our 95% to find 1% and then times that by 100 to get 100%. How do you go from 95% to 1%? You divide it by 95. So we can do 551 divided by 95. And if we do that, we're going to get 5.8. So £5.80. Now that we have 1%, we can use that to find 100%. So we can times it by 100. That's going to give us 100% of our original price. In other words, just our original price, 5.8 times by 100. That's going to give us 580 pounds. And that's 100% of our original, our answer. Guys, hopefully that made sense. If it didn't, make sure you check out the video on, uh, on my channel because it explains this in a lot of detail and this does come up all the time. Some of you are going to be thinking, oh yeah, man, we could have just divided by 0.95, would have been way quicker. You guys are all correct. You could have just divided by 0.95, but this is the best way to do these questions because when they get a little bit trickier, it's important to understand what's actually going on. And by doing it this way, you find what's actually going on. And that's going to stand you in better stead to answer a greater variety of questions. So this is this is a good way of doing it. Ah, Ella, unlucky, unlucky. Hopefully it made sense why we did it this way, though. Hopefully it made sense why. Next question is on the screen now, guys. We have a three marker. Um, let's see what we can do. Let's see what we can do. What question is this? Eight. Okay. Lil said, can you use a multiplier? Um, yeah, uh, technically you could multiply by 100 over 95. You could multiply by 100 over 95, but I would recommend doing it this way, to be honest. I would recommend doing it this way. It's just better from an understanding perspective. What percentage of our original do we have? 95%. How do we find 1% using that? Divide by 95. How do we go from 1% to 100% times it by 100? Few people are dropping answers in the chat and I can see three answers and all three are different. I can see three answers and all three are different. Is that, are any of them correct? Um, let's have a look. Let's have a look. Now we're getting some matches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of different answers for this one. This one, again, I don't know who wrote this exam, um, but I don't think they I don't think they got a high grade in English, to be honest, because these are not worded in the most clear way, to be honest. Let's have a look. Um, drop ready in the chat when you're ready for me to go through it and we can talk about it. Jess said, where did you get the 95%? Um, that's because it was a 5% discount. So we went from 100% to 5%. OK, Fam Lam's ready. Karen's ready. Hafs is ready. Um, Man like Dylan, Pat is ready, S is ready, Unicorn's ready. Okay, guys, let's talk about it. What does the question say? It says, Joan invests £6,000 in a savings account. The savings account pays compound interest at a rate of 2.4% for the first year and then 1.7% for each extra year. It then asks us to work out the value of Joan's investment at the end of three years. What we're going to have to do is we're going to have to take our initial amount, increase it by 2.4%, Increase the result by 1.7% and then increase the result of that by 1.7% again. 
let's see what we can do. So we have £6,000. And we want to increase that by 2.4%. So we're going to multiply it by 1 plus 2.4% as a decimal. We can do 2.4 divided by 100. We get 0 0.024. Now, some of you might be thinking that we could have just done 1.024. That is exactly the same. So we can do that. So we have 6,000 and we're going to increase it by 2.4%. 6,000 multiplied by 1.024. That, guys, is going to be 6,000. 144 pounds. Now, we're told that the interest is compounding. And what that means is that when we get paid this next interest payment of 1.7%, we get paid on this amount. So now we have this amount here, and we're going to increase it by 1.7%. Now, one way of doing this would be to do this, 6,144 multiplied by 1 plus 1.7% 1 as a decimal. Find our answer and then multiply the answer of that by the same thing again because we need to increase it twice because we want at the end of three years, this was our first year, second year, and we would have to do it again. However, a quicker way of doing this is going to be to multiply this number by 1 0.017 or 1 plus 0 0.017 squared. And all this represents is that we're multiplying by this number and then multiplying by this number again. Like I say, you could do it in two steps. You could square it. This one's going to be quicker, so we're going to do it this way. We're going to do 6144 times by 1.017 squared. When we do that, guys, what do we get? We get 6,354 pounds and 67 pence, rounding that to two decimal places. Hopefully that made sense, guys. Any questions, let me know. Um, let's have a look. Let's have a look. A man like Merza said, if you watched the compound interest video from earlier, you would know. Yep, yep, that's true, actually. I did post a compound interest question earlier. Um, somebody said, no questions from me. Come on. Uh, somebody said, where does one come from? Now, the one comes from the fact that we're increasing this by 2.4%. To be honest, at this point in time, the best way of thinking about it is just going to be kind of as a formula. Normally, we focus on understanding, but in this case, it's going to be best thought of as a formula. We have our actual amount is equal to our initial amount times by one plus our interest rate to the number of time periods. Now, this is going to be the compound interest formula that works all of the time. The reason I didn't use it here is because we had different interest rates going on and this was only one period, etc. This formula is on the formula sheet, but it's written in a really nasty way. So I would recommend learning it in this form. I would recommend learning it in this form. If you're still not sure on compound interest, somebody did say, and they were right, that I did post a video on this um, earlier today on the TikTok. So you can check that out if, uh, if it's still a bit confusing. Question nine, we have a two marker everybody's favorite box plots, everybody's favorite. Sophie said, why did you square it? Great question. The reason was because we increased by that percentage twice, because there were two years where we had that 1.7%. Zed Khan said, how many marks was that? It was three marks, three marks. Looking at the chat now, guys, any questions, let me know. Can be about this one, can be about any questions so far. I should be able to remember them. Hello, Sam, welcome back. Uh, James Johnson said, please let me take a screenshot. Yep, I'll go back for a screenshot after this. I'll go back for a screenshot after this. Okay, guys, drop in the chat what you think is wrong with this, and let's see if we can come up with it. Let's see what we can come up with it. Well, let's see if we can come up with it. A couple of people are saying medium. Median wrong. Yeah, you guys are exactly right. And median is wrong. That is our first mistake with this graph. We can see that our median is supposed to be at 162. On a box plot, this line here in the middle of our box represents our median. And we can see that this is 161. It's not correct. 
from our table, it should be 162. So the median is wrong. Next, guys, what are we going to say? What are we going to say? Upper quartile is incorrect. Hafsa says, Karima says the same thing. And you guys are both correct. The upper quartile is in fact wrong. The upper quartile is in fact wrong. Or at least I should say the interquartile range up here is wrong. How do we find that interquartile range? Our interquartile range is going to be equal to our upper quartile subtract our lower quartile. We can see here that our upper quartile is equal to 172. This part here and our lower quartile, what is it? We can see that it's 154. Now to find our interquartile range, we would do 172, subtract 154, and we would see that it is not 17. It's actually going to be 18. It's actually going to be 18. Um, so yeah, that's the second mistake with this. Hopefully that makes sense, guys. Let me know in the chat if you have any questions. So we can say IQR is wrong as well. Or in fact, upper quartile is wrong. Having a look, Sean said it's okay. Amy said it's okay. Bree said silly. I don't know if that's silly Bree or silly Asia. Probably silly Asia. Guys, I don't know why they do this. I don't know why they do this. They make all of the students in the exam wrong. I said this the other day, but they cast off some bad energy, man. Like pretty much all the time when it says, is so-and-so correct? That's for the screenshot, guys. Three, two, one. Pretty much every time when it says, is so-and-so correct? They're always wrong. It'll always say a student goes and does this. Are they correct? And they're wrong, right? So they, they give off some bad energy. I don't know why they do it. Ah, Famalam, you are on it. Thank you, mate. Thank you very much. Guys, please respond to the poll now if you can. There's 220 of us at the moment. Now is where you have your say about the pace. We can speed up. We can slow down. We can stay exactly the same. Let me know, uh, let me know what it is, what you would like, I should say, and we can have a look. Okay, James said, go back to question eight to screenshot. I just did, but I can do it again after this. Guys, we have a few quick ones here, 10 A, B, and C, but don't forget to fill out that poll. Let's have a look. Somebody said, can you give a shout out to Jasmine? I'm not sure. I might, I might have missed something in the chat. Maybe it's Jasmine's birthday or something. Um, but shout out Jasmine if it's your birthday. <laughs> um, okay. Question 10a. What's it going to be? It says simplify 1 over m squared to the power of 0. Now, one of our indice laws tells us that any number whatsoever to the power of zero is one. So this number, one over m squared to the power of zero, is going to have to be one. That's what we're going to do there. Next question says, simplify eight times by x minus four over x minus four squared. We can think of this as eight times by x minus four over x minus four times by x minus four, because that's what x minus four squared means. Now we can divide top and bottom by x minus 4. When we do that, what are we going to get? We're going to get 8 over x minus 4 as our answer to that one. Finally, nicely done, Victor said cancel out. You're exactly right. Um, 10c, simplify. 3n to the power of 4, w squared to the power of 3. This one, guys, is actually really common in exams. Really, really common, and people often get it wrong. So let's see what we can do. How are we going to simplify this? we need to make sure that we cube every single term inside these brackets. So we have to cube our 3, cube our n to the power of 4, and cube our w to the power of 2. 3 cubed, what's that going to be? That's going to be 3 times 3 times 3, which is 27. Now, n to the 4 to the power of 3. One of our indice laws tells us that when we have a number to a power and we raise the whole thing, to another power, we have to multiply those powers. So n to the 4 to the power of 3 is going to be n to the power of 4 times 3, which is 12. We're going to do the same thing with the w. w squared cubed, 2 times 3 gives us our new power. w is going to be to the power of 6. We get 27, n to the power of 12, w to the power of 6. Guys, hopefully that makes sense. Let me know if you have any questions about that one, and we can answer them. M said, oh, makes sense. Sound of progress. That is the best sound. That is the best sound. Somebody said, what topic is this? This is laws of indices. Somebody wanted to screenshot question eight. I'm going to give you five seconds. Five, four, 
three, two, one. Now we're going to move on, guys. Now we're going to move on. Question 11 is here. Man like Jack is eating at quite a nice restaurant. Let's see what he's doing. Let's have a look. Nova's not a fan of these ones. Yeah, these ones, to be honest, are pretty annoying and they always forget to teach them in schools. Like, I think a lot of you will now be familiar with these questions because they've cut, they come up a lot in past papers. But a lot of people um, don't get taught this in school, to be honest. Schools always miss it out. There's certain topics um, which schools always miss out. And this is one of them. Sonia, you are on it. You are on it. Good work. Yeah, FamLam said never got taught it. It just came up once on a paper. To be honest, on paper two, this is a really common topic. Really common topic. May, you're on it as well. Man like Harold, man like Harry, both of you guys are on it. Let's have a look, guys. Question 11 says Jack is in a restaurant. There are five starters, eight main courses, and some desserts on the menu. Jack is going to choose one starter, one main, and one dessert. He says there are 240 ways that he can choose his starter, his main course and his dessert. Could Jack be correct? You must show how you get your answer. Now, these questions normally, instead of kind of asking us whether this is possible, they're just going to ask us for the number of possible combinations. And to find that, we would multiply the number of different starters by the number of different mains by the number of different desserts. For example, if there were three desserts, we would do five times eight times three to get our number of combinations. We want to know, though, if it's possible for the number of combinations to be 240. In other words, we want to know if it's possible for five times by eight times by our number of desserts, let's call it D, to be equal to 240. This is only going to be possible if when we find the value of D which gives this, we get a whole number which is possible. How can we simplify this? Well, we can do 5 times 8 is 40. So we have 40D equals 240. We can now divide both sides by 40 to get D on its own. We get D equals 6. What this tells us is that if the number of desserts is in fact 6, then there would be 240 different ways that we can choose the starter main and dessert. So there would be kind of, or I should say it would be possible. It would be possible. And they're the words I'm looking for. Okay, guys, any questions, let me know. Karen said, OMG, a student is finally correct. Yeah, 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 actually, yeah, good point. Finally, just after what I was saying about them uh, giving off the bad energy for the exams. You're right, Karen, yeah, finally. <laughs> Your future more like this one. Come on, that's good to hear. Nova said it makes sense now. That is a sweet, sweet sound of progress. Yeah, Bree said extremely rare student correct. Yep, <laughs> ain't that the truth? Okay, guys, let's have a look at the next question. The poll did pop up on the screen while I was doing that last one. So let me just have a quick look at it. Don't use this graph as an excuse not to do the question. You can absolutely do this question without having the paper printed off. So uh, even if you don't have this printed off, you can definitely do this question. Let me zoom in a little bit more so you can see with more detail and let's see what we can do. Let's have a look at that poll. What's it saying? We have, okay, more than half of people saying the pace is good. So we're going to keep the pace roughly the same. Few people were saying speed up. Few people were saying slow down. Guys, we're going to keep the pace roughly the same. Hopefully, uh, hopefully that's good. Hopefully that's good. It's definitely good for the majority. The people have spoken, so that's what we're going to do. Kieran said, will the gradient be negative? Yes, it will. Yes, it will. Um, Annabelle said, what iPad is this? This is an iPad Pro. This is an iPad Pro. Oh, yeah, it's my B-Day soon and I'm trying to get a new iPad. Hey, good luck. Good luck. That's all I can say. Um, it's definitely worth it. To anybody thinking about getting an iPad for A-levels, um, obviously they're expensive, so this is not going to be appropriate for everybody. Um, in an ideal world, we would all have iPads but or, or whatever. Um, but anybody who's thinking about getting one, I would say they're pretty, pretty good. I did, I've done a lot of revision over the years using this iPad um, and they are pretty good. So if you're on the fence, then... Uh, then yeah, it's, it's a good idea to get one. Equally, you definitely do not need one. You definitely do not need one. Okay. 
Guys, drop ready in the chat when you're ready for me to go through this. A lot of you won't like this type of question, but hopefully um, after I've explained it, it's crystal clear. Hopefully it's crystal clear. Okay, Baladip is ready, me is ready. Um, okay, guys, let's talk about it. How are we going to do it? Question 12. It says the graph gives information about the volume V liters of petrol in the tank of Jim's car. After it's traveled a distance of D kilometers, we have volume on the Y axis, distance on the X axis. It then says find the gradient of the graph. Now, the best way to find the gradient of the graph is to do, as you guys were saying, rise over run. Now, what does that actually mean? It means that we're going to choose two different points and we're going to do the change in Y between those two points divided by the change in X between those two points. So we could pick two points on the middle of our graph. Then we're going to have to find the change in Y and the change in X. Or we could just conveniently pick this point all the way over here at the start when X is zero and this point all the way over here at the end when y is zero. What's that going to allow us to do? Well, we can find the change in y between these two points. Over here, y is, there, is zero. And over here, what's the value of y? Zooming into our graph, we can see that this is going to be 27. So our change in y is 27 up here. So the change is minus 27. It goes from 27 to zero. Next, what are we going to do? We're going to find our change in x between these two points. Well, the value of x over here is 0. The value of x over here is 300. So it changes by 300. It goes from 0 to 300. So we have minus 27 over 300. Now, if we want, guys, we can type this into our calculator to simplify. If we did, what would we get? 27 divided by 300. That is going to be 0 0.09. And it's negative. So we have minus 0 0.09 as our answer. Few people are saying, why minus? The reason is because it's downward sloping. So you can think of the minus in two different ways. You could either just write this as 27 over 300. And then because this is downward sloping, it's minus. Or you could think about the fact that when y changes, it changes from 27 to 0. So it decreases by 27. It minuses 27. Famalam said, wait, would they give minus 0.08? Yeah, they would. Yeah, they would. Minus 0.08 would be absolutely fine. Um, Victor said, is that deceleration? Um, no, because we have volume here on the, on the axes. We have volume here on the axes, um, so it's not deceleration. Somebody said, is the denominator always positive? Um, in a question like this, yes, it would be, because you would always be going from left to right. So yeah, it would be in a question like this. Ah, ah, okay, that's why you were. Uh, that's why you asked that question. Fair play. Sorry, I uh, I didn't even see that question there. So that's the next question. Let's have a look. What does the gradient of the graph represent? Now, guys, this is a copy and paste question. A copy and paste question. Um, it's in a lot of different exams. Let's have a look how to do it. Whenever we're asked to identify the meaning of a gradient, pretty much it's going to be the rate of change. It's going to be the rate of change. Now, what is it the rate of change of? It's the rate of change of whatever is on the y-axis. So here we have volume of fuel, right? So it's the volume of liters of petrol in the tank. So it's the rate of change of the volume of of fuel, you could just write that, or if you want to give it a bit more pizzazz, you could say in Jim's tank. So pretty much always when we're asked the meaning of a gradient of a graph, it's the rate of change of something. In this case, what's it the rate of change of? It's the rate of change of volume. What about distance per liter? Um, Distance per liter. It would actually be liters per distance. It would actually be liters per distance. So it's like the number of liters used per distance traveled. Um, okay, looking at the chat now. Um, do you only use Sokar Toa on right angle triangles? Yes. 
Tom said volume of petrol use per kilometer. Absolutely perfect. Absolutely perfect. Okay, guys, next question. Let's have a look. Question 13 is on the screen. We are now breaking the back of this paper. There are 22 questions in total. Let's have a look. Uh, Andrew said, can you say deceleration or is that only used in physics? You can say deceleration if that was appropriate. So if it was speed and time, then it would be deceleration. Um, if it was speed on the y-axis and time on the x-axis, it would be deceleration and that would be perfect for um, the, your maths exam, but only if it's speed and time there, only if it's speed and time. Otherwise, we just say it's the rate of change of whatever is on the y-axis. A couple of people are saying they don't understand the sign rule. Don't worry, after this, hopefully it will be a lot clearer. Bree said, I can never tell between cosine and sine. Yep, I'll also talk a bit about that. I'll also talk a bit about that and we'll see what we can do. Zane said, you get this on the formula sheet. Yeah, you do actually, you do actually. So let me write this on. One thing is to spot that it's a sine rule. And once you've figured that out, you can use the formula on the formula sheet which tells us that a over sine a equals b over sine b. Now on the formula sheet, it also says equals c over sine c, but you don't need that part. You absolutely only need a over sine a equals b over sine b. So I'll write that formula on there for you guys because um, you guys have it in your formula book. Liv says, um, isn't cosine whenever it has one angle and doesn't have opposite sides that match? yeah 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 you can say that you can say that i'll explain it though in in a bit of detail so hopefully it'll make sense for everybody um hopefully it'll make sense hey amt no worries at all no worries at all people are going to be dipping in dipping out here for a while gone for a while no worries live no worries and for those of you struggling to see how we can use the sign rule, let me give you a quick hint and then I'll give you guys another minute to go through it. We want to first find the size of this angle here. How are we gonna find the size of this angle here? We know the angles in a triangle add to 180. So we can do 180 minus 34 minus 26. If we do that, we're gonna get 120, which is the size of this angle. Hopefully then it's a little bit more clear how to use the sign rule. It might still be unclear, that's absolutely fine. And I think there's, yeah, 250 of us at the moment. For the majority of people, um, this will be a very difficult question. This will be a very difficult question. Guys, drop ready in the chat when you're ready for me to go through this and we can talk about it and we can talk about it. Okay, Annabelle's ready, Nova's ready. Guys, let's talk about it. Loveheart's ready, Landrew's ready. Come on, Ella's ready, Samira's ready, let's go. So let's, or what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk through this question and I'm gonna talk through my thought process in, uh, in terms of working it out. So the question says, here is the triangle ABC. And then it says, work out the length of AB. Give your answer correct to one decimal place. What am I thinking? I turn over the page, I see this question. I'm thinking, okay, we have a triangle and they're asking us to work out a side length, this side here in particular, AB. They give us a side length, two angles. Okay, it's not a right angle triangle. So I'm thinking, okay, so Kartoa in the bin, let me see, can it be the sine rule or the cosine rule? Now, when we look at this triangle, we firstly see that we're given two angles. That is a telltale sign that we're gonna have to work out the third. We're not always gonna have to work out the third, but it can definitely help us. So let's work out that third angle, we get 120. Now we're going to see, can we use the sine rule to work this out? When it comes to choosing either the sine rule or the cosine rule, my advice, the best approach is going to be to check if we can use the sine rule. If we can use the sine rule, we use it. And if we can't use the sine rule, then we check for the cosine rule. So always lead with the sine rule because that's the easiest to spot. Now, how can we spot when we use the sine rule? We use the sine rule whenever we're dealing with two pairs of opposite sides and angles. We can see in this question that we want the size of x and we have this angle here, 34 degrees. In addition to that, we have the size of angle A, 120, and we have the size of the opposite side length. So we are in fact dealing with two pairs of opposites, so we're going to use the sine rule. Now, what does the sine rule tell us in our formula book? It tells us that A over sine A is equal to B over sine B, where our lowercase letters 
are side lengths and our uppercase letters are the angles which are opposite them. Angle A has to be opposite side length A and angle B has to be opposite side length B. So we can substitute our values into this equation and see what we get. Let's say that our X is our A, so we get X over sine of the opposite angle, 34 degrees, equals B, another one of our side lengths, 23.8, opposite, sorry, over the opposite angle, sine of 120. Now, some of you guys are going to be thinking, yeah, but you've messed up your labelings. This is supposed to be A, so why haven't you put A as 120? The key is that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter which you put in each of the gaps as long as you have them in two pairs of opposites. So the key is that 23.8 is opposite 120, so they're paired up like this, and X is opposite 34, so they're paired up like this. This, guys, is now an equation which we can solve to find the value of x. At the moment, x is being divided by sine 34. So to get the x on its own, we multiply both sides by sine 34. We get x equals sine 34 multiplied by 23.8 over sine 120. Now, this is a little bit long and it looks quite intimidating, but this is just something we can type into our calculator. We can type in sine 34 multiplied by the fraction 23.8 over sine of 120. And when we type that into our calculator, guys, what do we get? We get 15 point... Oh, we get 15.367, etc. The answer asks us, or the question asks us to give our answer to one decimal place. So we round this to one decimal place. We look at our first decimal, look at the number after, because it's a six we round up. What do we get? We get 15.4 as our answer. That is going to be the size of our side length. Guys, talk to me in the chat. Let me know. How was that? CE said I put 23.8 before the sign 34. Um... That's absolutely fine. That's absolutely fine. If you mean you did um, 23.8 sine 34 divided by sine 120 and got this answer, that's absolutely fine. That's absolutely fine. Um, hey, no worries, Mr. G. No worries. Hopefully you got something nice. Um, Unicorn says it makes sense. Fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, Pomida says, still don't understand. Hey, sorry to hear that. If, uh, if you want the explanation again, this recording will be uploaded to the channel. Um, Tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. Okay, okay. Next question on, actually, I'll give you guys five seconds to screenshot. Five, four, three, two, one, and we're going to move on to the next question. Somebody just asked, would they ask us to prove the sign rule? Absolutely not, absolutely not. You are not going to like this one, I don't think. This is a tricky question. I would say this is probably the hardest question yet. Hey, Nova, that's, uh, that's great to hear. That's great to hear. Hopefully it made sense for you clearly. Question 14, and I'm going to give you guys a couple of minutes on this, and then I'm going to give you a hint. Um, and uh, yeah. <laughs> Victor said it's only a tick box. Hey, you're going to have to read it again, mate. You're going to have to read it again. Some people are saying they like questions like this. If you do, hey, congratulations, because this is a difficult question type. Zane AB said, what time are we finishing? I think we're going to be finishing at seven o'clock. We are on track to finish at seven. Maybe we're going to go a little bit later, quarter past latest, probably. So my hint is going to be this. Let's read the question and I'm going to do the first line of working out and give you guys a bit more time to solve it. The question says here are two squares A and B. And then it says the length of each side of square B is four centimeters greater than the length of each side of square A. It then says the area of square B is 70 centimeters squared greater than the area of square A. It then says, find the area of square B, give your answer correct to three significant figures. You must show all your working. Some of you guys will be looking at this very puzzled. The number of people on the stream has dropped significantly. So a lot of people have thought, okay, let me check out because I don't like this question. How are we going to do it? We read this and we spot that we're told that the side lengths of B 
are four centimeters greater than the side lengths of A. That is kind of a hint that we're going to have to set up an equation where the side lengths of B are four greater than the side lengths of A. How can we do that? Well, we can let the side lengths of A be X. Then what are the side lengths of B going to be? Well, they have to be four greater than the side lengths of A, so they're going to be X plus four. We have squares, so we can label this x and this x plus 4 as well. What are we told in the question? We're told that the area of B, so this area, is 70 centimeters greater than the area of A. How can we write an expression for the area of B? Well, we have a square to work out the area of a square. We do base times by height or multiply the two widths. So we have x plus 4 times by x plus 4. And what do we know about this area? We know that it is 70 greater than the area of this shape. What's the area of this shape? Two side lengths of x. x times x is x squared. So this is equal to x squared plus 70. The area of b is the area of a plus 70. Where can we go from there? We now have something which we can solve. Now, let me know in the chat, guys. Do you want me to go through this? If you do, write ready. And if you want more time, write more time. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Okay, family lamb's ready. Nova's ready. Zed's ready. Okay, most people are ready. Most people are... A few people are saying more time. I'm going to go with the majority. The majority are saying ready. But if you do want more time, turn down the volume now for 30 seconds. Give it a go. And the answer will be on the screen in a couple of moments. For those of you who are ready, let's talk about it. So we have an equation which we can now solve. How are we going to do it? Well, we want to firstly expand these brackets. When we expand these brackets, we use FOIL. We do x times by x, x squared, x times by 4, so we have plus 4x. 4 times by x, we have plus 4x. 4 times by 4, we have plus 16. That's going to be equal to x squared plus 70. On the left-hand side of our equation now, guys, we can collect our like terms. 4x plus 4x is going to be 8x. So we have x squared plus 8x plus 16 equals x squared plus 17. Now we can see that we have x squared. And when we have x squared, it's a giveaway sign that we're going to want to get everything onto one side. That's because we have a quadratic which we can solve. But in this case, when we try and do that, we can see that when we move this x squared to the other side, it cancels out with this one. We minus x squared from both sides. We get 8x plus 16 equals 70. Now we have a linear equation which we can solve. We're going to subtract 16 from both sides. 8x equals um, 54. Now we can divide both sides by 8 to get the x on its own. We get x equals 54 over 8. x equals 54 over 8. We now have the value of x. 54 over 8, if we want, we can write that as a decimal. What's it going to be? It's going to be x equals 6.75. Is our work done, though? No, it's not, because we want the area of b. What is the area of b? Well, it's x plus 4 times x plus 4. If x is 6.75 x plus 4 is going to be equal to 6.75 plus 4, which is going to be equal to 10.75. Now to find the area of b, we're going to do 10.75 times 10.75 because we have two side lengths of x plus 4. So we do 10.75 squared. I put that in brackets, but you don't have to. When you type that into your calculator, guys, 10.75 squared, what are you going to get? You're going to get 115 point five six two five as your answer the question though tells us to give our answer to three significant figures so we're going to round this um, this is our first significant figure second and third so we look at our next number it's a five so we round up five rounded up goes to six we get our answer guys of one one six now that was a long question that was definitely not an easy one i don't care what anybody says in the chat anybody who's saying it was easy that was not an easy question um very few people in the exam would get that right but hopefully it made sense once i went through it the highest liked that one hamza got it nice okay okay few people got it few people are saying it was horrible ben is in the chat welcome my friend welcome KB says, I understand that now. Fantastic. Nice work, Scarly. Hey, Scarly, you've been making some progress. 
Um, Sean liked it. Okay, okay. Looking at the chat now, guys. Five seconds to screenshot, I'll give you. Five, four, three, two, one. And then I'm going to move on to the next question. Question 15 on the screen. If you guys have any questions, though, about 14, let me know. And, uh, and I can answer them. Uh, Nova said, where did you get the X squared from 70 plus 70 from? So basically, we worked out that the, or we labeled the side lengths of A as X and the side lengths of B as X plus four. And the question told us that the area of B was 70 more than the area of A. The area of B was X plus four times by X plus four. The area of B was X squared. So we know that because the area of B is 70 greater, X squared plus 70, so the area of A, X squared plus 70 had to be equal to X minus four squared. Hopefully that made it a bit clear. I know it might not have been convenient with it not being on the screen. I'm guessing you had the paper printed out. Um, let me know if you have any more questions. 15 though is going to be annoying for a lot of people. Let's have a look. A couple of people are saying rotation. It would actually not be a rotation. A couple of people are saying they don't like this one. A couple of people are putting parts of the right answer in. Let me tell you guys, after I go through this, this should be clear. This should be clear after I go through it. Again, it's a tricky one, but it does come up a lot. A bunch of people are saying enlargement, that would get you one mark out of the two. There are three key details which we need to get both of the marks. We need an enlargement, we need a scale factor, and we need a, um, yeah, an enlargement, we need a scale factor, and we need a center of enlargement. Yeah, exactly, Victor, exactly. So an enlargement of something, with some scale factor, and we also need some uh, center of enlargement. Okay, are you ready, guys? Let me know in the chat. Have you had time to think about this? Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Ah, uh, guys, this is tripping a lot of people up, and also a lot of people who I, I know get a lot of marks. So listen carefully. I'll explain this and the best possible way to do it. So let's have a look. We have these diagrams, A and B. It says, describe fully the single transformation that maps A onto B. Now, we look at these two shapes. We know that our four transformations are rotation, reflection, enlargement, and translation. We see that it is a single transformation. The only one of these that can change the size of a shape is an enlargement. That is how we know that it absolutely has to be an enlargement. And don't worry, we're going to talk about the funky flipping and stuff. But just here, because the size has changed, we know it has to be an enlargement. That's going to be the first part. So we know this is an enlargement. And I said we need two more details. We need a scale factor and we need a center of enlargement. Let's go with our scale factor. Two parts to this. The first is we've gone from A to B. The first part of our scale factor is going to be how many times bigger has our shape got? We can see that all of these side lengths before were two boxes along. So this was two boxes horizontally, two boxes vertically, two boxes diagonally. Now it's three, three, and three. So our scale factor is 1.5. That's because 3 is 1.5 lots of 2. You could otherwise think of this as 3 over 2. That is the part of our scale factor which determines the change in the size of the shape. However, there's another thing. And the other thing is the fact that we can see this shape has flipped. This shape has flipped. The orientation of the shape has changed. And that's a giveaway that it's going to be a negative scale factor. So not only has the size changed, but also it's gone in the other direction. So it's a negative scale factor. Next step, finally, finding our center of enlargement. Now, this can be a nightmare if you don't do it this way. What's the best way going to be? It's going to be to draw lines which connect each of our new points with each of our old points. Once we've connected those points where all of those lines intersect is going to be our center of enlargement. So we get our center of enlargement, guys, of 1, 1. Now, this was not easy. This was definitely tricky. There were three different ingredients. Yeah, exactly. Center, uh, 
Center 1-1. One, one. Good shout, Famila. Center 1-1. One, one. So, three steps. This is often forgotten in schools. If it's the first time you've ever seen this, don't let it uh, make you panic. I've just explained everything you need to know. Number one, because the size of the shape has changed, it has to be an enlargement. Number two, the enlargement is going to be negative because the orientation of the shape has also changed. It's facing a different direction, right? So that makes it negative. Next up, how do we get the scale factor? It goes from two to three. So it's 1.5 times the size. So it's negative 1.5. In other words, negative three over two. Final step, how do we find our center? We join together our old points and our new points with straight lines and they all intersect at our center. Now, this question was tricky. Um, but uh, hopefully that makes sense. Dylan Pad, good question. Said, do you need to write three over two or can you just write 1.5? 1.5 is perfect. Three over two is also perfect. Any more questions, guys, let me know. I'll give you a couple of seconds to screenshot. Ah, Hafsa said, I thought it said from B to A. Yep, easy mistake to make, easy mistake to make. Yeah, well explained, your future more. Okay, guys, next question on the screen. Question 16. How are we with our sequences? 17 is also on the screen for anybody working quickly. By the way, three marks for this is absolutely brutal. Absolutely brutal. I think it should be four or five personally. Hey guys, the, the likes are a bit higher than normal today. That's uh, that's pretty cool. But definitely don't focus on the likes. Focus on the maths. We used to do like running up the likes and I think we got one of the streams to like over 500k. But around the time of exams, hey, resting your wrists is way more important. Focus on the writing, focus on the maths. Rest those fingers. That's what I'll say. Um, somebody said, why are the numbers so big? Yep, it's annoying. It's annoying. Yeah, Gecko said, my hands are dead from history. Yep, that is a uh, lot, a lot of writing. A lot, a lot of writing. Victor said, people type anyway. Yeah, fair, fair. Yeah, Gecko said, <laughs> man said, I got maths and history on the same day. That is horrible. That is horrible. I remember I had my A-level German exam on the same day as my A-level maths exam. I had German in the morning. And then I had A-level maths in the afternoon. So I had to isolate for a few hours. And then I was in like my own room for the maths exam because they, the rest of the people did it when I did my German, right? And uh, so it was me on my own in this room with one invigilator. And the whole time the invigilator was trying to talk to me. The whole time the invigilator was trying to talk to me. So that's why I'm not a big fan of invigilators in general. Okay. Let me know in the chat when you're ready and we can talk about it. Let me know when you're ready and we can talk about it. Yeah, exactly. She was trying to talk to me in the exam uh, and it was, it was, and trust me, it was bad. It was bad. Okay. This is a tricky one. Samir is ready. Star's ready. Um, guys, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Question 16 it says, here are the first five terms of a quadratic sequence. Find an expression in terms of n for the nth term of this sequence. Now, you might currently know nothing about this topic. You might currently hate quadratic sequences, but this one question is enough to understand it. It's going to be difficult, but if you focus properly, you can learn this whole topic now. What are we going to do? When it comes to finding the nth term of our quadratic sequence, there's going to be a few different steps. What are they going to be? Firstly, we're going to write out our sequence and we're going to find the difference between the terms. To get from 10 to 21, we add 11. To get from 21 to 38, we add 17. To get from 38 to 61, we add 23. And to get from 61 to 90, we add 29. Now, this is a quadratic sequence, so we also have a second difference. We can find the second difference between these terms. To get from 11 to 17, we add 6. 17 to 23, we add 6. 23 to 29, we add 6. Now, normally for quadratic sequences questions, this number is a 2. We halve that number 2, and we get 1n squared. Then we take away n squared from each of our terms. We find the nth term of the new sequence, and that's our answer. But this is going to be a little bit more challenging because here we have a 6 here instead of a 2. 
So again, we're going to look at this number. We're going to halve it. We're going to get 3, and we're going to write that in front of our n squared. So we know the first part of our quadratic sequence is 3n squared. What's the next step? Our next step is going to be to write out our sequence again. 10, 21, 38, 61, 90, along with our term numbers. This is the first term, second term, third term, fourth term, and fifth term. Now, we look at this over here, 3n squared, and we're going to subtract 3n squared from each of our terms. Now, what do I mean by n squared? n is going to be our term number. So this is the first term. So we do 1 squared, which is 1, times by 3 is 3. Here we're going to do 2 squared, which is 4, times by 3 is 12. Here we're going to do 3 squared, which is 9, times by 3 is 27. Here we're going to do 4 squared, which is 16, times by 3 is 48. Here we're going to do 5 squared, which is 25, times by 3 is 75. Now, I did that quickly in my head. You could definitely use the calculator for that. Next step, we're going to find the difference between these two. We're going to subtract these from our original sequence. 10 subtract 3 is 7. 21 subtract 12 is 9. 38 subtract 27 is 11. 61 subtract 48 is going to be 13. And 90 subtract 75 is going to be 15. Now, this is a new sequence which we can find the nth term of. The final step of this question is going to be to find the nth term of this sequence and then to tag it on to the end of here. What's the nth term of this sequence? To find the nth term of a linear sequence, we find the common difference first of all. To get from 7 to 9, we add 2. 9 to 11, we add 2. 11 to 13, we add 2. 13 to 15, we add 2. What does that plus 2 tell us? It tells us that the nth term of this sequence is going to start with 2n. Now, how do we go from this to the um, nth term of this sequence here? We see how do we go from this number here to the first term of our sequence? How do we go from 2 to 7? We add 5. We add 5. So we get 2n plus 5 as the nth term of this sequence here. The final step of this question then is going to be to get this nth term and tag it on the end of there. We get 3n squared plus 2n plus 5 as our final, final answer. For some of you guys, you will have never seen that before. For some of you guys, that will have made sense. Some of you will be thinking, why have we got 3n squared here? Let me know in the chat if you have any questions, and I can answer them now. Our answer, though, was 3n squared plus 2n plus 5. Okay, quite a few people are confused. Quite a few people are confused. Guys, let me know in the comments if you, or in the chat, I should say, if you have any particular questions and I can answer any of them. This was, like I say, tricky question and absolutely brutal for three marks. Absolutely brutal. You wrote 12. I wrote 12? Where? where? Ah, ha, yeah, good spot, good spot. My bad, my bad. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you. Okay. Um, how to get the numbers 3, 12, 27, 48, 75. So how did we get these numbers? These numbers were 3n squared, where n is our term number. So this was our first term. So we did 1 squared, which was 1, times 3 from up here, gives us 3. This, 2 squared, so subbed in 2, 2 squared, which was 4, times 3 gave us 12, and we did the same thing for each of our terms. Why is it plus 5? The reason that it's plus 5 is that to go from 2 to 7, we add 5. So <clears throat> in theory, how do we find the nth term of this sequence? We find our first difference. That tells us the number which goes next to the n. And then we look at our first term. We substitute in n equals 1. And that just gives us this number here, which is 2. And then we see how we go from that number 2 to this term here, the first term, which is 7, we add 5. I always use the first term because whenever you substitute in n equals 1, this just becomes this number. That's why I said, how do we go from this number here to 7? Because when we substitute n equals 1 in, this is just 2, right? So we just do 2. How do you get from 2 to 7? We add 5, so it's 2n plus 5. Let me know, guys, any more questions. Otherwise, we'll go on to question 17. Hey, that's nice, Mr. Gilly. Back and had a spag bowl for dinner. That's, uh, that's a good, good shout. Good, good shout. 
Sorry, I don't know if you guys could hear that. I just cricked my neck. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully that didn't sound and come through. Oh, chicken biryani for John. Come on. Ah, uh, family, I'm heard it. Ah, uh, yeah. Sorry about that, guys. Sorry about that. That probably didn't sound great. Bit of ASMR or whatever it's called. Um, okay, question 17. Question 17. Let's have a look. It said, write down the coordinates of the turning point of the graph y equals x plus 12 squared minus 7. So this is an equation of a quadratic graph which has already or which is which is sorry already in completed the square form so they have already completed the square for this quadratic here and now we can just read our turning point from this the turning point how do we find it when a quadratic is in this form we look at the number in the brackets here it's plus 12 we swap the sign minus 12 and that gives us our x coordinate so the x coordinate of the turning point is the reverse of the number inside the brackets if this was negative 12 the answer here would be positive 12. what about the y coordinate of the turning point that's just going to be this number on the end of our quadratic we read it it's minus 7 and we don't change the sign so for the x coordinate we do change the sign plus 12 goes to minus 12 for the y coordinate minus seven, we don't change the sign. Now, most questions are not going to give you the uh, quadratic already in completed the square form. Most questions are gonna give you a quadratic such as this, y equals x squared plus eight x minus, well, let's do um, plus 20 and ask you to find the turning point of this. Now, how would we find the turning point of this one? We would firstly have to complete the square. How do we complete the square? We write y equals, we open a bracket, we write in an x. We look at the number next to the x, here it's an eight. We half it and we write that inside our brackets. So half of eight is four. So we write a four in the brackets. If this number was negative, this number here would be negative because this is positive, this is positive. We then square our brackets, we copy down our plus 20 here, and then we look at the number inside the brackets, here it's 4, we square it and we take it away. 4 squared is 16, so we take away 16. We then have y equals x plus 4 squared, 20 subtract 16 is 4, so we have plus 4. Now, how do we find the turning point of this? The x coordinate of the turning point, we check the number inside the brackets, it's plus 4. We reverse the sign, we get minus 4. Y coordinate, we look at the number on the end, it's plus 4. So we just keep the sign the same and we get plus 4. Now, for anyone wondering, that was a completely separate question. I just illustrated that to show also how to complete the square. That was a completely made up example, completely made up. This was the actual question minus 12 minus 7. This is what you would do if they didn't give you it already completed the square. This is how you would complete the square. Okay, guys, question 18. How many questions do we have? 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Okay, for anybody wondering, I estimate we're going to finish at about quarter past seven. We are going to do this whole paper. The last question, though, I'm going to do pretty quickly because it's quite brutal. Uh, M wants the screenshot. Okay, um, let me give you five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Next page. You've had your time. Question 18, guys. Pesky question. This pesky question. Love Heart said, will the lives be on the channel? Yes, they will. Yes, they will. All of the lives are uploaded the day after um, at 9 a.m. Oh, people are not liking this one in the chat. People are not liking this one. A lot of people are saying they men mentally check out as soon as they have to read. Yep. But this one is quite mathsy, I will say. <laughs> a bit of a weird thing to say, isn't it? During a maths pass paper, but this is quite a mathsy question. A few people are saying skip. Okay, fair enough if you're going to skip it now. It's five to seven. You guys are probably tired. You've probably been doing stuff today. We've been cracking now for almost two hours. But if you are going to skip it, make sure you listen very carefully when I explain it, because a lot of you who will have checked out for this one will find that you could actually do it. So please don't skip the question. Give it a go. But even if you do skip it, 
absolutely make sure that when I explain it, you listen carefully because it should fall into place. Mumu said, keep going. Hafsa said, let's get this, guys. Exactly. That, that is what I should be saying. But I do understand that it is five to seven and a lot of you guys are going to be tired. But I am saying it on the condition that you make sure that you listen when I do go through it. Yeah, Namjoon said, you don't need half of the info stated in the question. That is true. How many marks is this one? This is a four marker. And guys, drop ready in the chat when you're ready for me to go through it. Is this a, a frustrum thing? Yep, it is. A quick hint for anybody who's stuck is that this cone, this shaded one, is going to be similar to the overall cone. So if you think about this diameter and you think about this length versus this length, you can find the scale factor and you can use the scale factor to find the diameter of this, the diameter of this to find the radius of this, and then use that to find the size of this. That was just a quick hint, very quick, for those of you who were stuck. Other than that, I'm going to go through it. Um, okay, okay, let's talk about it, guys. Let's talk about it. Question 18. It says the diagram represents a solid cone. The cone has a base diameter of 20 centimeters and a slant height of 25 centimeters. A circle is drawn around the surface of the cone at a slant height of 10 centimeters above the base. The curved surface of the cone above the circle is painted gray. Work out the area of the curved surface of the cone that is not painted gray. Give your answer as a multiple of pi. You must show all your working guys. Let's make this clear. Let's make this clear. So first thing, what are we trying to work out? We're trying to work out the area of this surface here. So it's going to be the area of, or the, yeah, the curved surface area of the total cone. Subtract the curved surface area of this cone at the top. That is going to be our um, method. So we need to work out the curved surface area of the total cone, subtract the curved surface area of this cone. Let's do that. So what's going to be the curved surface area of the total cone? Well, we're told over here that the curved surface area of a cone is equal to pi times the radius times by the slant height. So we're going to use that formula. For the big cone, we have pi times by our diameter is 20, so our radius is 10. So pi times by 10 times by our slant height. The slant height of the overall cone we can see is 25 centimeters. So we have pi times by 10 times by 25. Now, if you type this into your calculator, it would simplify it for you to 250 pi. 25 by 10 is 250, and then we tag on our pi. So now we have the curved surface area of the total cone, couple of marks in the bag. How are we going to find the curved surface area? of this cone. Let's have a look. Well, to work out the curved surface area of this cone here, we need two pieces of information. We need the radius of this cone here, and we need the slant height here. We don't have either of those pieces of information, so let's work them out. We see that the overall slant height of the shape is 25. The slant height of this side here is 10. So the slant height here is going to be the difference between 25 and 10, which is 15. So this side here is going to be 15 centimeters. Now, how are we going to find the radius of this cone here? This is going to be tricky, but let's have a look. When it comes to working out the diameter of this cone here, we're going to use the fact that this cone here is going to have to be similar to the overall cone. We know that it's similar because it's a part of the same cone, so it's a similar cone. Now, how can we use that information? Well, how can we work out the scale factor between the overall cone and the smaller cone? We know the ratio of the side lengths. This is 15 centimeters. The overall slant height is 25, so we know that we have 15 over 25 of the lengths of this cone here. That means we know that this diameter here has to be 15 over 25, lots of the diameter down here, which is 20. So 15 over five times by 20. Now, this is something that we can bing into our calculator. When we do 15 over five, sorry, 15 over 25 times by 20, what do we get? We get 12. That tells us that our diameter here is 12. Where can we go from there? Well, we now have the diameter of this. We can halve it. That
that gives us the radius times that by 15 to get our slant height. So our curved surface area of our smaller cone, that's going to be equal to pi using this formula here, times by our radius of 6, times by our slant height was 15, which if we type into our calculator will give us 90 pi. Now we know the curved surface area of the total cone, 250 pi. We're going to take away the curved surface area of the small cone, 90 pi. We do 250 pi, subtract 90 pi, and we get our answer, 160 pi. Guys, that is going to be our answer to question 18. Talk to me in the chat. How did we find that? To those of you who didn't understand it before, hopefully it made sense a little bit more afterwards. Um, Jack Hodd, nice work. Nice Livy. Nice Patrick. Nova said it actually wasn't too bad. Yeah, good work, guys. Good work. Fatima said it makes sense now. That is the best. That is the best sound. Amy said it's still confusing, but not too bad. Yeah, that's also great because what that shows you is it's gone from super confusing skip me to, okay, that makes a bit more sense. Guys, we have still got pretty much a week. Yeah, exactly a week until our first maths exam. That means we've got time to pump out a bunch more past papers. We've got time to make a lot more progress. So even if this just went from very confusing to a bit confusing, next time we hit a question like this, it'll go from a bit confusing to making sense. Let's have a look. Jasper, it's been great to have you today, mate. Um, hopefully you got a nice evening ahead. Somebody said, what topic is this? This is frustrums. This is frustrums. Or you could say surface area of a cone. Okay. Five seconds to screenshot. Five, four, three, two, one. Let's go. Question 19, 20, and well, 21 and 22. Okay. Okay. We might go a little bit after quarter pass, a little bit after. Ah, okay. That's good. That's good. Um, she said, I'm so glad I stayed because I would have hopped on Netflix. Yep, exactly, exactly. And this is a far better thing to be doing. And guys, when we finish this at quarter past seven, you can then turn on your Netflix, turn on your Xbox, turn on your PC if you're into that stuff, and then have your fun knowing that you've put in a good solid two hours of work. That is what it's about. Chilling out and watching Netflix isn't fun if you've been doing it all day. Chilling out and watching Netflix is a lot of fun if you know you've had a good productive two hours and that you've kind of earned your time. So uh, let me say that. This is a nasty looking question. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Hey, Scarly, no worries that you have to go. I know a, quite a few of you actually have to go at around the time of seven. So is that because you've kind of like uh, freed up the time until seven for the stream? Because I know I say that I go live five until seven and normally we end up finishing about quarter past or 20 past. Um, I think the pace is pretty good at the moment. So if people are kind of having to get cut off at, at seven because they said they would go out or something, um, then uh, maybe I'll kind of publish or put on this schedule that it's going to be a bit longer. Yeah, I also eat my tea late, Gecko. I also do the same thing. Yeah, most people have dinner at seven. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. There's 22 questions. Okay, let's have a look. Question 19. Guys, this is another one where if it didn't make sense to you or it looked like gobbledygook, make sure you listen carefully because hopefully I'll translate this from some BS maths language into something which is clear so that next time you get a question like this, you can understand what it's trying to say because this is in very mathsy language. So let's talk about it. Question 19. A hot air balloon is descending. The height of the balloon n minutes after it starts to descend is hn meters. So the height n minutes after it starts to descend is hn. The height of the balloon n plus one minutes after it starts to descend. So the next minute is given by the height one minute later is equal to k times by the current height after n minutes plus 20, where k is a constant. The balloon starts to descend from a height of 1,200 meters at 9.15. At 9.16, one minute later, the height of the balloon is 1,040 meters. Work out the height of the balloon at 918. Now, a normal iteration question is going to give you your iteration equation 
and then ask you to use that to find a few more numbers. But in this case, they don't actually give you your equation because they don't tell you the value of k. Instead, they give you some information here, which you can use to find out the value of k. So how are we going to do it? Well, this equation tells us how we go from the height at a minute to the height one minute later. So at time n, or to get from the um, height at time n to the height at time n plus 1, we multiply the current height by k and then add 20. The question then tells us the height at 9.15 and one minute later at 9.16. We know that the height at 9.15 is 1,200 and the height at 9.16 is 1,040. What that means is that the next period height at 9.16, um, 1,040 is equal to k times by the height one minute before, which was 1,200, plus 20. So what we've done is we've substituted in the height at this next minute, 1,040, and we've substituted in the height at the previous minute, 1,200, and we now have an equation which we can rearrange to find the value of k. What are we going to do to get k on its own? Well, we're going to subtract 20 from both sides. 1,020 equals 1,200k. 1,200k is just the same as k times 1,200. Now we can divide both sides by 1,200. What we're going to get is 1,020 over 1,200. Typing that into our calculator, guys, 1,020 divided by 1,200 we're going to get 0 0.85. So now we have found the value of k for our iteration equation. We have h n plus 1 equals 0 0.85, which was our k, times by the current height hn plus 20. We have found the value of k using those two values. What are we going to do now? We're going to make these a little bit smaller. We're going to bring this up and we're going to use this to find our heights. Oh, somebody said, should we run it up to 50K? Let me explain this and then we can run it up. Or maybe you're asking that to the people. You guys can do what you want, but make sure you're listening to this. <laughs> um, okay, so um, we have now our um, iteration equation and we can substitute in 916 to get 917. So the height at 917, so let's call that H17, is equal to 0.85 times by the height at um, 9.15, which was, or sorry, uh, 9.16, which was 1,040, plus 20. This is something which we can bing into our calculator, guys. 0 0.85 times by 1,040 plus 20. Typing that in, we get 904. Now we can find H18, which is going to be equal to um, 0 0.85. 85 times by, now we're going to substitute in our previous value, 904. And then we're going to add our 20 on the end. We get 0 0.85 times by 904 plus 20. 0 0.85 times by 904 plus 20. Guys, typing that in, what are we going to get? We're going to get 788.4, which is going to be our answer for the height at 918. Nicely done, Jash. Guys, let me know in the chat. How was that? How was that? Victor says dub. Nice. Well done, mate. Nice. Nicely done. <laughs> Gecko said, forgot we were doing maths, got, dis got distracted by the food. Fair play. Fair play. Can't blame you for that. Um, okay. Few people zoned out. It was a difficult question, guys. I did explain the whole thing. Um, I'm not going to have time to explain it again, but if you do want to listen to it back, like I say, this will be uploaded to the channel tomorrow morning, 9am. So, uh, so you can you can check it out there. Um, five seconds to screenshot. That was a four marker. Five, four, three, two, one. Let's go. Question 20 on the screen. Any particular questions, let me know. I have to say question 20, 21 and 22. We have got some tricky questions coming up. Uh, by the way, Mr. Gilly Famalam, if you want to like use the like pinning comments in the chat to for like running up the likes and stuff like that, you have full permission. You have full permission. You guys can do what you want. Like I trust your judgment. If people are wanting you to pin stuff, which is like appropriate or whatever, go ahead, go ahead. Um, 
I just don't have time to respond to everything while I'm teaching. So uh, you guys can you guys can respond to the people. M said, let's get to 100K in it. Yeah, we could do, we could do. That would be a throwback to the old times. Come on, Bellingham. Thank you very much, man. <laughs> um, okay, let me know. Question 20, when we're ready to go through it. These Question 20 is a difficult probability one. If you guys are pushing for a grade eight or a grade nine, you definitely want to listen in carefully to these ones. Also, if you're pushing for a grade seven, listen carefully to these. Yeah, these are uh, these are higher questions. Samir is ready. Let's have a look. Okay, let's talk about it, guys. Let's talk about it. So the question says, there are only red sweets and yellow sweets in a bag. There are N red sweets in the bag. There are eight yellow sweets in the bag. Sajid is going to take a random sweet from the bag and eat it. He says the probability that the sweet will be red is 7 over 10. Show why the probability cannot be 7 over 10. This is a tricky question, guys. How are we going to attack it? Well, to find the probability of taking a red sweet, how would we do it? We would do the number of sweets which are red divided by the total number of sweets. Let's do that and see whether it can be 7 over 10. How many red sweets do we have in the bag? We have n red sweets. So we have n over how many sweets in the bag do we have in total? Well, we have n red sweets and 8 yellow sweets, and there are only red sweets and yellow sweets, so we have n over n plus 8. Now, we want to see whether this, which is the probability in algebraic terms of getting a red sweet, can be equal to 7 over 10. Now, can n over n plus 8 be equal to 7 over 10? Well, let's try and find what n would have to be for n over n plus 8 to be equal to 7 over 10. How would we do this? Well, at the moment, we have an n plus 8 on the bottom of a fraction and a 10 on the bottom of a fraction. So what we can do is we can cross multiply these fractions. We can multiply both sides by 10 and both sides by n plus 8. If we do that, on the left hand side, we're going to get 10n. On the right hand side, we're going to get 7 times by n plus 8. Now, this is an equation which we can solve to find the value of n. We have 10n equals 7n plus 7 times 8 is 56. We can subtract 7n from both sides. 3n equals 56. We can now divide both sides by 3. We get n equals 56 divided by 3 is going to give us 18.6 reoccurring. Now, this shows that the probability can't be 7 over 10 because if we wanted the probability probability to be 7 over 10, then n would have to be 18.6 reoccurring. You can't have 18.6 reoccurring sweets because it has to be a whole number. Therefore, the probability cannot be 7 over 10. That, guys, is how we're going to do that one. Next, let's have a look. This question here is a 5 marker. This has been on the screen for a while. A few of you might have started to give it a go. This is, again, a tricky question. Let's see what we can do. Um, a few people are saying I did it a different way, but got it. Awesome. Um, as long as you got that 56 over 3 as N, then absolutely perfect. You don't have to use that method. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, Eric, a good spot. Said, uh, student is wrong again. Shocker. Ella's saying, look at the poll. Let's have a look at the poll. What have we got? Uh, ha, bro. Allow the VSs. We don't need the VSs. <laughs> not, 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 that's not what the polls are being used for. <laughs> to be fair though the name famalam is uh it's a good name i don't know when you came up with that famalam cuz name but you can't you can't debate with that name that's uh i think if you did famalam versus any name on uh if you did famalam versus any name famalam is going to come out on top because that's a very good tiktok name that's all i can say yeah yeah it was 50 50 it was 50 50 um, Mr. Gilly's also a wicked name, but Famalam's too catchy for, for a TikTok name. Okay, let's have a look, guys. What do we reckon? Let me know when you're ready and we can go through it. Let me know when you're ready and we can go through it. Oh, 
Okay, Kareem is ready. M's ready. KIB is ready. Let's have a look. What are we going to do? So, after Sajid has taken the first sweep from the bag and eaten it, he is going to take at random a second sweep from the bag. The question says, given that the probability that both the sweeps he takes is will be red is three over five, work out the number of red sweeps. Oh, that's not a good sign. In the bag, you must show all your working. Guys, let me just plug this in because we can't be dealing with an iPad running out of charge and then I'll go through it. Okay, just getting the charger. Let's have a look. There we go, running out of charge, not an option for us. So how are we gonna do it? Given the probability that both the sweets he takes will be red is three over five, work out the number of red sweets in the bag. How can we express the number or the probability of both sweets being red? We know initially from the previous part that we spoke about that there are N red sweets and N plus eight sweets in total. This is the probability that the first suite we take will be red. Now, we know that he takes this suite out or a red suite out, and then we want to find the probability that the next suite is red as well. How many red suites are there going to be after he takes one red suite out? Well, if there were N before, there's going to be N minus one now. How many suites in the bag are there in total now? There's going to be N plus seven suites in the bag, which is one less than N plus eight. This is going to be the probability of taking our first red sweet and then our second red sweet as well. When we find the probability of these two things, it has to be equal to three over five. This is now an equation which we can rearrange and solve for the value of n. Let's have a look what we can do. On the top, we have on the top of this fraction here, we have n times by n minus one. So we have n times by n minus one over n plus eight times by n plus seven. That's going to be equal to 3 over 5. We're going to cross multiply these fractions. So we times both sides by 5 and we times both sides by n plus 8 times by n plus 7. When we do that, we get on the left hand side 5 times by n times by n minus 1. And on the right side, 3 times by n plus 8 times by n plus 7. This is an equation which we can solve. 5n times by n. 5n squared. 5n times by minus 1, minus 5n. n plus 8 times by n plus 7, what are we going to get? We're going to have 3 times by n squared plus 15n plus 56. We can expand these brackets. We have 5n squared minus 5n minus 3n squared plus, sorry, uh, equals 3n squared plus 45n plus uh, 3 times by 56 is 168. Running out of room, let me make this a little bit smaller. In reality, in your exam, they give you a lot more space. So I'm just trying to cram this onto one page to keep things clear. Now we collect our like terms, bring everything onto one side, subtract th uh, 3n squared from both sides. We get 2n squared, subtract 45n from both sides. Um, minus 5n minus 45n is going to be minus 50n and then subtract 168 from both sides minus 168 equals zero next step divide all of our terms by two that is going to give us a quadratic with n squared at the front n squared minus 25n minus 84 equals zero Finally, this is a quadratic which we can solve. We can solve this by factorizing using the formula or by completing the square. We always try and factorize first if we can, so let's do that. We need to find two numbers which multiply to give 84 and add to give, or multiply to give negative 84, I should say, and add to give negative 25. Let's have a think. Let me just think for a second. Yeah, we could do that. We could do 8. Um, I don't know why I wrote that. So the front of our brackets, we're going to have n's. 
because we need n times by n to give us n squared. And then, like I say, we need two numbers which multiply to give negative 84 and add to give negative 25. Let's see, guys, can we come up with anything? Or have I? Yeah, let's see, can we come up with anything? Yeah, nice, Mo's got it, come on. We have negative, ah, close Mo actually, very close. Think again just for a second. Or, or were they your actual answers maybe? Either way, whatever, we can factorize this. We need two numbers which multiply to give 84, negative 84, and add to give negative 25. We have negative 28 and we have positive three. Why is it that? That's because negative 28 times by three is negative 84. And negative 28 plus 3 is negative 25. Now, when it comes to finding our possible values of n, we have to swap these signs, n equals 28 or n equals minus 3. Now, can we have a negative number of sweets in the bag? Because at the end of the day, that is what n represents. No, we can't. We cannot have a negative number of sweets. We have to have, therefore, 28 sweets in our bag because n, a number of sweets, cannot be negative. Guys, let me know in the chat how did we find that one. It's not the clearest. Sorry about that. I'm trying to cram it in, changing the sizes, but hopefully the working out made sense as I went through it. That was a trick. That was a tricky one, though. That was a tricky one, though. Okay, Amy said that was actually okay. Yeah, lots of rearranging, lots of rearranging. What did we do? We set up our equations. Probability, the first one being red, probability, the second one being red. Times them together. That had to be equal to three over five. This was an equation which we could rearrange to find the value of n. Simplify it, cross multiply it, gave us this, and then rearrange it. Ultimately, we get a quadratic, n equals 28. Guys, we are on the final stretch, questions 21 and 22 now. Let's have a look. 22, you got to brace yourself for that one because that was annoying. Uh, Ellie said, I have to go for dinner now. Got salmon and pasta. See y'all later. Hey, see y'all later. Good to have you today, Ellie. That's a uh, good, good choice for dinner. Love a bit of salmon. Love a bit of salmon. Probably one of the best foods, I would have to say. Probably one of the best foods. Hey, no worries, Kira, no worries. Hopefully this evening's been beneficial. Yeah, nine says salmon's too goated. Yep, you're right. Guys, we're gonna be finishing in the next 10 minutes. So if you can bear with me till half past, we're gonna get this paper finished. Okay, let's have a look. Question 21, how are we gonna do it? It says the graph of the curve with equation y equals f of x is shown on the grid below. And then it asks us on the grid below to sketch the graph of y equals f of minus x, a graphical transformation. Which one is it gonna be? Well, this takes all of our x points and turns them into minus of whatever they were before. Every x coordinate, which was one side of the y axis, is gonna be on the other side. We're gonna flip this curve in the y axis. So we're gonna go up here to two, and then we're gonna come down to here, and then we're gonna go back up to here. So that is what we're going to do. This is going to be a reflection of our curve in the y-axis. All of the x-coordinates have become negative what they were before. This topic, for anyone wondering, is graphical transformations. Okay, next question, B. What does it say? It says the curve C with equation y equals 5 plus 2x minus x squared is transformed by a translation to give the curve S such that the point 1, 6 on C is mapped to the point 4, 6 on S. Find an equation for S. Now, what's it going to be? This one's a little bit different, and this doesn't come up that often in exams. So it's a bit, it's a bit naughty that they've done this, because it's a bit ambiguous also in the spec whether this is technically included, but hey, it's in the exam, so let's do it. What are we going to do? We can see that this transformation from curve C to curve S is a translation three units to the right. The y coordinate stays the same, but it moves three units to the right in the x direction. So this is a transformation three units to the right in the x direction. Now, if our curve had equation f of x, this would turn into f of x minus three. 
But we can see that our curve currently has this equation here, y equals 5 plus 2x minus x squared. So what are we going to do? Instead of having f of x and swapping x for x minus 3, we have this, and we're going to swap x for x minus 3. We zoom in, and we copy down our exact same equation, but all of our x's we swap for x minus 3. So 2 times by x goes to 2 times by x minus 3, minus x cubed goes to minus x minus 3 squared. Sorry, I meant squared there, not cubed. Um, but yeah, we swap the x's for x minus 3's. Few people are saying why minus instead of plus. Fantastic question. The reason is because whenever we have a translation in the x direction, we flip the sign of whatever it is. So you would expect this to be plus 3, right? Because you're moving in the positive direction. But when it's in the x direction, you have to reverse the sign. So three units to the right, you change the x by subtracting 3 from it. Next question is going to be our final one of the day. Question 22, a five marker to end the day. And then we're going to have our little party at the end like we always do. Like we always do. Hey, I've just seen, by the way, 85K likes. That's not bad. That's not bad. Um, okay, nearly done. Final question of the day, 22. C is a circle with center at the origin. A tangent to C passes through the points negative 20, 0, and 0, 10. Work out an equation of C, which is, remember, our circle. You must show all of your working now to help you guys in the right direction. Let me just draw a quick sketch. Let me just draw a quick sketch so we can see what's going on. We have an X and a Y. We're told that there's a circle C with center at the origin. Let's draw that on. A circle with center at the origin, Gucci Gucci. And then we have a tangent which passes through the points minus 20, 0. That's minus 20, 0. And 0, 10. Zero ten. 10. So that is the situation we're working with. That is the context we're working with. And where do we go from there? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm pretty tired. So I'll start speaking in a bit of a uh, Gucci Gucci. You know, I'll start uh, bringing, some of the, uh, bringing some of the slang out. <laughs> um, I, bet you never, I bet you never thought you'd hear maths described as Gucci Gucci. <laughs> um, okay. Giving you guys a little bit longer for this. I'm now going to draw this on just to hint some of you guys in the right direction. And that is all I'm going to say for now. This is the point we're trying to work out. I'm going to give you guys another one minute or so looking at the chat now before we go through it. Oh, it's paused. Wait, can you guys hear me? Hopefully it's not paused. Annabelle says, Wadius. Yeah. Was I? Yes, you can hear me. Okay, perfect, perfect. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Also, I appreciate a lot because when I ask a question like that, a lot of you guys, especially the regulars, um, all reply. And I appreciate that a lot because it makes things very clear. So thank you guys for replying when I, uh, when I ask something. Okay, are we ready? Drop ready in the chat when we're ready and we can talk about it. This is a tricky question. I would say this is a very tricky question. <laughs> Matt said we won't be able to hear you ask if not. Yeah, that's true. Okay, Ellie's ready. Ali 15 is ready. Emma is ready. Ella is ready. Cameron is ready. Guys, let's bang out the final question and then we're going to do a double party. We're going to do a double party for the 100K and most importantly, for finishing this paper. Guys, what are we going to do? So, C is a circle with center at the origin. A tangent to C passes through the points minus 20, 0 and 0, 10. And I've drawn that on the diagram. Tangent to C means it touches at one point, And we see that this has a x-intercept of minus 20, y-intercept of 10. It then says work out an equation of C, the circle. Now, the general equation of a circle is going to be x squared plus y squared 
equals r squared. This is always the equation of a circle in GCSE. This is a circle which is centered at the origin and has a radius of r. In order to work out our circle equation, therefore, we need to find the value of r, which is going to be the length of this here. Now, how are we going to find the length of this thing here? What we're going to need to do is we're going to need to find the coordinates of this point here, because then we can use the length of this and the length of this and use Pythagoras to work out this. So let's do it. How are we going to work out the coordinates of this point here? First off, we see that it's on this line. So what we're going to want to do is find the equation of this line here. How are we going to do that? To find the equation of this line, we need two things. We need the gradient M and we need the y-intercept C. Our y-intercept is where it crosses the y-axis. We can see that this is the point 0, 10, so C equals 10. What about our gradient? How can we find the gradient? We spoke about this earlier. To find the gradient, we can do rise over run, change in y divided by change in x. Between this point here and this point here, we go up 10 units from 0 in the y direction to 10 in the y direction and across 20 units. So we have a half. 10 over 20, a half. So the equation of this line is y equals a half x plus 10. We've now got the equation of this line here. Where can we go from that? Well, to work out the coordinates of this point, we're going to also find the equation of this line here and then solve them as simultaneous equations. Guys, I know this is difficult. Last question of the paper, definitely grade 9, grade 9 plus, I would say. How are we going to find the equation of that line? Well, to find the equation, we need two things. We need the gradient and we need the y-intercept. It passes through the origin, so we know the y-intercept is 0. So it's going to be y equals mx plus 0. What's the value of m, our gradient? How can we do that? Well, we know that this line here is going to be perpendicular to the tangent here. It's going to be perpendicular to it. And what that means is that the gradient is going to have to be the negative reciprocal of this number here. To do the negative reciprocal, we find the number which we multiply by the gradient here to get negative 1. What do you multiply a half by to get negative 1? You multiply it by negative 2. So our gradient is going to be negative 2. So the equation of this line here is going to be y equals negative 2x. We now have the equation of this line here, our tangent, and the equation of this line here, which is our normal to that tangent passing through the origin. We can solve these two equations as simultaneous equations, and that is going to allow us to find the coordinates of this point here. How are we going to do that? Well, we want to solve y equals minus 2x, and y equals half x plus 10, as simultaneous equations. The best way to do this is going to be to worry about that. <laughs> the best way is going to be to set them equal to each other. We're going to have minus 2x equals a half x plus 10, setting them equal to each other. This is an equation which we can rearrange to find the value of x. We're going to add or sorry, we're going to, yeah, add 2x to both sides, move the 2x over there, subtract 10 from both sides, move the 10 over here. We're going to get minus 10 equals 2.5x. Next step, we can divide both sides by 2.5 to find the value of x. 10 divided by 2.5, that is going to be 4, so we get x equals minus 4 as the x-coordinate of this point here. How can we find the corresponding y value? Well, we can substitute x equals minus 4 into our equation. We have y equals minus 2 times by x, so minus 2 times by minus 4. Minus 2 times minus 4 is 8, so we get y equals 8. That tells us that the coordinates of this point here are minus 4, 8. Final step, how can we find the value of the radius? Well, we now know that to get from this point here to this point here, we go 4 to the left from 0 to minus 4, and we go 8 up from 0 to 8. So we can use Pythagoras' theorem. We have a right-angled triangle. We use a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So we have 4 squared plus 8 squared equals c squared. 16 plus 64 equals c squared. 80 
equals c squared. So we know that the length of this side is going to be the square root of 80. The radius of our circle is the square root of 80. Finally, what can we do? We can plug this radius back into our equation of a circle. The equation of a circle is x squared plus y squared equals r squared, where r is the radius. So we have x squared plus y squared equals the square root of 80 squared. The square root of 80 squared is just itself, 80. So we have x squared plus y squared equals 80 as our final answer, guys. That is going to be the equation of our circle. Yes, to those of you wondering, this is long. Let me know in the chat. Did that make sense? Let me know. I haven't looked at the chat in ages. Somebody tried to FaceTime me, so I had to say no to that. Um, let me know. Okay. Okay, okay. A lot of people didn't get this. A lot of people didn't get this. What I'm going to say is, if you didn't get this, don't let that stress you out. This is the hardest question in the paper by a long way. This is like a high grade nine question. Even if you're aiming for a grade nine and you didn't get this, don't let that stress you out. This is just the question they give us at the end of the paper to really push us. If you want kind of a full explanation, um, watch this back tomorrow morning, 9 a.m., and you'll be able to kind of slow down what I said. But yeah, that was a difficult question, so don't let it stress you out. Okay. I'm not going to have time to go through it again, though. So, uh, so yeah, sorry. Family Lamco says, is that simultaneous equations you did? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Okay, guys. So we have now finished this paper. So, Victor, you are exactly right. It is time to party. Guys, let's put those celebration emojis in the chat because it's half past seven. We have put in another big two-hour shift. Congratulations. This is how we make progress. This is how we make progress. You guys are putting in the time. You're putting in the work. We're wrapping out the past papers and it will pay off. So it's time to party. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Bree is partying. Zed Khan says, yay, finally. Hafsa said, we've made it out alive. Damn right. Alice said, good work, everyone. You're troopers. Exactly right. Exactly right. Angela's partying. No worries, your future ma. Hopefully you've had a good paper today. Good session. Ends partying. Unicorn says, yay. Mr. Gilly says, let's go. Um, awesome, awesome, awesome. Gecko, you're very welcome. You're very welcome. Ella said, Gucci, Gucci live. Come on. That is exactly what it is. This is a Gucci, Gucci live. Um, Mr. Gilly says, relax tonight. Exactly. I don't know your guys' plans tonight. I'm about to go to the gym because I didn't go this morning. There's a steam room and all that over there. So I'm going to go chill out. I don't know what you guys are doing. K says, time to sleep. Damn right. Rizza says, thank you. You're very welcome, my friend. You're welcome, YS. Good to have you. Somebody's going to watch uh, Harry Potter. Come on. Oh, Jamie Dillon said Europa League final time. Nice, nice, nice. Mr. Gilly said, what's the workout routine? Um, this evening is going to be a little bit of push and pull, you know, going with some dumbbell presses, then a few pull-ups. Everything, mate, everything. The climbing workout tonight. <laughs> um Okay, any questions, guys, let me know. I can hang around for a couple of minutes and then I'm going to have to shoot. Cassie says, up the Spurs or oh, Casey. <laughs> Ella said, uh, drop the skincare routine. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to drop the skincare routine, but if anyone's actually interested, you can send me a DM and I'll tell you. I'll tell you because uh, I don't want to put it on uh, on actual social social. But if you're actually interested, then uh, then I can uh, I can I can let you know let you know the stuff because it's quite important. I used to struggle a bit with my skin, so I know that I know the struggles. If uh, if you're going through it, if you actually want me to, um, send me a DM and I'll let you know. It's uh, it's a big thing though. A lot of people struggle with their skin. I struggled for a while and I finally finally managed to find a solution. So uh, if you're actually interested, you can send me a DM. Ooh, Victor said personal care section on the Discord. That is actually not a bad idea. That is something I would think about doing. That is actually something I would think about doing. If you're interested in that, um, I don't know, send me a DM or let me know in the Discord because that's actually important. I, I could actually help you guys out with that. Um, okay, okay. 
a little bit of stress management, a little bit of lifestyle stuff. We can definitely do that, to be honest, because that'll help a lot. Angel said, summer is looking sweet. Damn right. Damn right. You guys are going to have an awesome, uh, awesome summer. Okay, guys, I'm going to have to shoot off now. Um, so I'm going to say once more, very well done to you all. Another day, another past paper. The progress is going to be unbelievable. Guys, I hope it's been good for you. Chill out this evening, watch your Netflix, go play your Xbox, do whatever you do, and I will catch as many of you as possible tomorrow. Adios, guys. Catch you later.